we are calling to order at 6.32 p.m. the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee seeing the presence of the quorum. And calling to order uh, Union 26 seeing the presence of the quorum at 6.32 p.m. You want to go first? Um, no, I, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, all right, the chair of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee uh, seeing the need to do so is uh, hereby uh, offering a motion to enter executive session in accordance with open meeting law, Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 21A, pursuant to Purpose 3, to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non union personnel, and in this case, Sean Mangano, with plans to return to open session. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, this will call a roll call vote. I'll start on this end. Sullivan, I. Demling, I. Ordonez, I. Hazard, no. I. Oh. Hazard I. Mary Aid I. Kosensky I. Nakajima I. I <laughs> it's okay. I'm all right. And for Union 26, uh, move to enter into executive session in accordance with the open meeting law, MGL 30A, section 21A, pursuant to, pur to purpose three to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non union personnel, Sean Mangano, with plans to return to open session. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Um, and we'll do a roll call vote. We'll start from that side. Cassins and I. Married I. Hazard I. Ordonez I. Demling I. And we are now in executive session. For both. Oh, just for the record, I was. Okay, reopening uh, open session of the regional committee. <coughs> yeah. And re entering open session for Union 26. Okay, the first item of business is to uh, consider uh, the contract for Mr. Sean Mangana. Um, is there a uh, is there a motion? I move to accept the contract for Tom Mangana. Is there a second? Second. Okay. This is for the regional committee, of course. We'll have to do the same for the unit twenty six. Um, the uh, the general terms of the contract uh, go for two years, uh, and without further action or notification by the committee uh, no later than 90 days prior to the expiration of it uh, the contract would renew automatically um, the salary terms are uh, negotiated each year with the current term uh, contemplated in this contract July 1st 2018 to be uh, 118,267 dollars which is an identical amount as to what he has currently been paid. So as is consistent with other uh, contracted um, parties in central office, he's in other senior leadership of the district, he's receiving no increase this year. Uh, I don't know if there are any other additional comments or information reflected in this contract that people have had. Okay. Uh, do we, we, we want to move yours or do we want to just vote this thing? We'll vote this one then. Yeah. Okay. Then if there's no, without further debate, if there is any further comment or debate, including encomiums of praise for Mr. Mangala. <laughs> yes, Mr. Dunlap. I'll, I'll give some, what did you call it, encomium praise? Encomiums. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in my one year there. on the committee, I've been extremely impressed with his service to the district. Um, when I think of the resources that are the most important for steering a steady ship, particularly with something as complex as a regional school committee, um, he's, he's pretty much near the, or at the top of the list, and uh, I, I, I very much appreciate his, uh, his uh, desire to continue on, and, and I, I, I just feel like we're very fortunate to have him as our financial director. Thank you. Uh, any further comment? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the contract with the regional, by the regional committee signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously. And for Union 26, can I get a motion, please? Move to approve the contract of uh, Sean Mangano. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any further comments? Okay. We'll take a vote, um, starting from that end. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're not roll call, right? oh, I guess we're not doing roll call. We're just doing, yeah. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just left executive session, so there's a. <laughs> so, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, um, and it carries unanimously. Thank you very much.
And I just wanted to take a moment mm -hmm. as well to uh, thank Mr. Mangano for his service. Um, he, I think, in the past two years that I've been on the committees, um, has shown himself to be somebody who is just incredibly adept at handling multiple personalities, different points of view, uh, different agendas. Um, he's involved in our union negotiations, he's involved in our school committee work, budget planning, you name it, <laughs> he's there. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for your service and thank you for your interest in this district uh, and in our community. Okay, and uh, we are going to take a motion to adjourn Union 26 because our business, official business is over. Uh, no, actually, I think March 12th was not a Union 26 meeting. Okay. It's labeled. It says it's labeled. It says it is. Yeah, but it's. Oh, I'm pretty sure that wasn't a, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mr. So I think um, the Union 26 part was executive session. Those minutes are not um, in not the even, packet to be right. voted um, tonight. I think the only aspect that could be voted is that there was a roll call vote to enter executive session um, by Union 26. So they didn't meet in public session briefly. Um, that still sounds like something that needs to be approved. I would agree. But I, I just think the confusion piece is that the, the work, the bulk of the work happened outside, uh, in exec, excuse me, in executive session, but I agree with Mr. Nakajima that approving the, that part of the minutes uh, is important. Okay. Um, I will take a motion then to approve the minutes for uh, Union 26, and then maybe we can dismiss committee. That's okay. I move to approve the minutes of March 12th. Thank you. <coughs> Second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Great, thank you. And I will now take a motion again, or do I have to take a motion again since we already moved and seconded? Yeah, okay, so we'll take a motion again to, uh, to adjourn Union 26. Just playing it safe. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay. Union 26 is adjourned. Thank you very much. So now we're at the regional committee. Um, we are considering the approval of the minutes of March 12, 2018. So please take the time, if you haven't already, to take a look, see if there's any changes. Yeah. Just to edit on the attendance. Yep. Um, to identify me as the Lovett representative. Yeah. Look at that. Oh. It'll make your comments down below make much more sense. Than <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I have Come one on. word change. This is going to be in the middle of the very long paragraph number three. Okay. Uh, Mr. Demling noted that he is concerned that the reality is that the community was not aware of this potential change. Th this might be a kind of a subtle distinction, but. Um, I remember my general point being that the, the, the greater community, um, the, the way this reads, it could be interpreted that my concern is that no one was made aware of it. And so the, the, the concern that evolved through that discussion was, was how widely broadcast um, the, the message got out. So I would just add the word greater community. Okay. Reality is that the greater community. Should ask actually. Does our recorder have that? Yeah. I, can you say just identify the location? I got the words, but I missed the yeah, location. It's, um, section three. Yeah. It's the middle of that huge middle. section three yeah. paragraph. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay. Is there is there anything else? Okay, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of March 12th, 2018. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Anything further? Seeing none, uh, all those approving the minutes of March 12th as amended, please signify by raising your hand. Carries, uh, carries with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight votes. Are there any nays, any abstentions? Abstention. What abstention? Miscarriage. Okay. On to announcements and public comments. 
Uh, before we get to any announcements from the school committee, we'll entertain public comments. If there are any public comments, please come forward. Uh, you'll have three minutes to speak, and please identify yourself. Weird feedback. Uh, please identify yourself before doing so. See what happens? Um, just from a process perspective, yes. we're about seven minutes before this is listed on the agenda. Um, so I'm happy to do a superintendent update or something else to fill seven minutes if the committee would like me to do so. I think I think that's I think that's fair in the sense that if somebody comes in in the next seven minutes, we can sort of float this a little bit. I think what we need to do <coughs> is maybe bold cap the all times are approximate <laughs> because unless there's a big controversial issue coming up, I don't really want to always have to just stop our meetings. Mm -hmm. if I, I mean, it's rare enough we're ever running ahead of schedule <laughs> that the idea that we would suddenly become an enemy to our process, that we would say, my God, we're too efficient. Let's <laughs> recess for half an hour. I mean, we did it last time, but last time there was an exceptionally good reason to do so. Yeah. Exceptionally good reason. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy to, uh, any announcements from the, to the school committee? Yes, I, I have one. I'm just hoping that, um, Everyone was able to see the posters that are on the floor and there's a couple taped up and this banner right here that are from our Amherst High School students who participated in the walkout last, last week. And the reason I put them on the floor is because I, I had a number of conversations with my own daughter about these shootings and they're getting they're too common. And she was one of the students who helped put it together and so I saw a number of posters and one day I thumbed through them when they were against the wall in the house and I'm like yeah 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 but then the next day I walked in and they were on the floor and they were still in process and the markers were down there and it just like as my thought it just shook me like to my core when I read that I shouldn't be afraid to go to school and am I next? I mean, those were the two, they were just sitting on my floor and they literally floored me. You know, because I, I had seen them when I flipped through them, but just seeing them laid out there, it was actually scary. And so I'm hoping that everybody got to s take a look at them when they walked in. And I, I would be collecting them later and they're going down to Washington, D.C. with Abigail, who was the lead on the walkout. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, Thank um, you. It was a, it was a, um, oh, yeah, you a really that. remarkable day. And I thought that the, I thought there were a few things that were amazing about it. I mean, principally, I thought the expression and the dedication and the um, collective action, meaning just the solidarity of so many students coming out and, and standing with one another and, um, expressing so clearly in their voice the, both their solidarity with Parkland students but also their message was incredibly powerful. Um, I also thought that it was um, in its own way as great that as the, the um, demonstration essentially progressed, a number of students felt comfortable going back inside when it was over as going uptown. And I thought that the the ability of the, of the student body, at least by what it looked like, to support one another on how they were gonna participate, how they were gonna express themselves was really great. And then the third point I'd make is just that I thought that, um, I said it on the day, I thought the Principal Jackson and the Superintendent and others undoubtedly, many others, you'd tell me it's, you'd listen to everyone else who did it, but I was there and saw both of the leadership of both of you was just really remarkable in helping to create an environment that I think our district should be proud of, both in terms of what it meant for the students and supporting their expression, but also keeping people safe, keeping the school running, um, keeping students being educated who prefer to stay in the classroom. And it's, it's really a profound statement of respect for the students, respect, respect for the community, respect for the moment that we're in, and also a real dedication to the craft of your jobs. And I just thought it was I mean, is it as important as I thought what the students did and what your leadership did, Abigail, I thought that um, the leadership of the district also stood up in terms of what they should be doing. And so both 
or all sides really had something to be proud of that day. <laughs> no, no, no. This We're almost back on time, by the way, so just keep talking. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say that my daughter um, uh, was, was here, and I, I actually was with another parent um, in a meeting in Springfield, and so our daughters were here. And I think the other parent, you know, probably sort of wanted to be here and figure out if she was going to participate or not. Um, but I did feel um, confident in the school district and in the students um, that everything would be fine. And um, so I just wanted to express that vote of confidence. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. It, um, so I just want to acknowledge, and I know other people will as well, uh, it's my understanding that this is the last regional meeting for Ms. Swamini Cage and Ms. Hazard. So I just want to share an appreciation for their uh, individual and collective work on two committees. Uh, we spoke a little bit, Ms. Swamini Cage wasn't able to be there at the last Amherst meeting, but I want to just acknowledge um, my personal appreciation from my vantage point of being able to work with both of you uh, on issues that were critical and in challenging moments, as well as critical in the slow moments that people um, that don't necessarily pay attention to because they're like the paint drying model, uh, <laughs> and they have huge implications in terms of the structure and functioning uh, and future of our school district. So I want to personally share my appreciation for both of your um, your leadership and your membership on both committees. So thank you very much, and enjoy thank your you Tuesday much. nights, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've got to schedule a special meeting for the 27th, don't we? There's got to be there something. There was going to be one. There's got to be something. We've got to work really on that. really quiet when I immerse that night. So uh, <laughs> but thank you. Exactly. Thank you very much. Did anyone else have anything to say? I mean, because we, we otherwise we'll be doing it later at the end. Gentlemen, this is a different topic. Oh no, dude, that is so wrong. <laughs> that is so wrong. That is so wrong. I mean, a point of dudeness. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Doney. All right. Um, just, just want to get a committee brief update that uh, Mr. Donias and I have been pushing the ball forward on uh, regional transportation reimbursement advocacy. I know a scintillating topic that the public is waiting on an update for for bated breath, but it has a big um, financial impact to our district. We lose hundreds of thousands of dollars every year because the state does not fulfill its promise to reimburse our regional transportation. So um, uh, Mr. Jennings can maybe sp speak a little bit uh, to this too, but we're, um, we have a, uh, a meeting with Representative Kulik um, scheduled. We've reached out to every other regional school district in his district. We, there are another, another half dozen or so, and heard back from almost every one of them, anxious to to join us, and so we think that will be a, a good thing. Um, uh, I went to a advocacy workshop um, by MASC rep um, Tracy Novick, who if any of you know or follow on Twitter, Twitter is a, a very um, engaged online um, knowledgeable source for state level advocacy. Um, and so we, we met with other regional school committees and um, our reps and uh, talked about ad advocacy effectiveness, specifically related to this issue, so she was, she was very helpful there. And um, the regional school district that is most affected by this issue, uh, Wachusett, um, that, that's where the workshop was, and um, they're actually um, already organizing online. There's a website called imwachusett.org um, that started out just as a local advocacy organization, but it's grown to include other regional schools. There's about 58, I think, regional schools in our state. Um, and so they're organizing campaigns around this and other related issues to regional schools. Um, so a lot of interesting activity. Of course, it's kind of time compressed because the state budget train is moving along, and so we're, we're trying to do what we can. Um, but I just want to let you know that we are moving forward on that. If we have things that we want the community to engage, engage in, we'll, we'll bring that to the table as well. And just to add very quickly, so the, um, the group that Mr. Demling mentioned actually also has a Facebook page, and they have uh, linked to a series of events that they're having um, other school committees, regional school committees, engage in around the state. So there's letter writing to the editor. Um, there are, you know, social media events that they've scheduled. So there's a lot of different ways for school committee members to participate as well that don't require sort of action at school committee level, but can actually just be, you know, serving as mm -hmm. advocates on behalf of their communities. Um, so if you go to support MA regional schools on their Facebook page, you'll find um, a list of all the different activities and events that are going on there. Members of the public can, of course, participate as well if they'd like, superintendents, you know, pretty much anyone. Um, but it's just a great way to plug into what's going on. So I think, by the way, that um, uh, it's always challenging when people are on the committee for a while and then leave 
I find in general, I'll repeat these comments in another month or so, that, um, you know, it's fascinating to me to watch that, the lo that by the time basically people are ready to leave and do other things with their lives, they're actually hitting on all cylinders and are just like <laughs> master craftsmen of their job. <laughs> and I'm not saying you're, I'm not, I'm not, I've only been here for a year and a half, so I'm not criticizing anything anyone did before, but I'm saying, well, I've been here, I've just watched both Vera and Phoebe just do not only a good job, but I could see them getting better every meeting and every month in what they were doing. And so I think it's, it's all I'll say is since I know there'll be new members coming on, if they pay attention to these meetings and if they watch it all, they should be, in the same way that I had a learning curve, and I imagine Mr. Zemling, remember last year we were talking about like just getting up to speed and jumping in on stuff, and it can be challenging. Even if you're paying attention, you come on, you think you know something that's really challenging, is I think people have, if you're, whether you're doing, I think, a really great job on helping you get the uh, superintendent evaluation work done and a lot of the policy work that we've done, or whether you've been a tireless and effective advocate um, for the school equity and for um, people who need that advocacy in our community and want to know if it's being reflected on the committee, I think both of you are going to leave big shoes to fill. And um, I admire the work you've done, have done and, I, and I still regretted hearing that you weren't going to be here. Um, but uh, life goes on, and there's a yeah, metaphorical or spiritual beach somewhere for you that hopefully <laughs> you can relax on for a while, and that's a good thing. Um, but I think we've done a lot of good things. Certainly, in the time I've been here, I felt like we've done a lot of good things, and I'm really proud of it. Um, I'm going to take slightly out of order the chair's report just because it's relevant. I, my, the other day I was talking to um, Senator Sonia Chang Diaz for a little bit, and um, as you know, she's been pushing a bill to do um, foundation budget um, reform for Chapter 70. And so there's been sort of a debate simmering over whether or not if there is legislation that would pass, it would pass um, after hopefully the fair share amendment passes and everyone knows there's money, or whether it would happen beforehand and sort of set a framework for distributing um, increases in state aid. And um, she indicated the other day to me that she thought it was conceivably possible that it might move this year as opposed to next year. And so, and mainly because the number of, in her mind, the number of at least senators who've endorsed it, and so the level of general agreement around the insufficiency of funding of that, of that item, uh, line item, is, is significant enough that there might be the momentum to move it. And so I bring that up only because I think when we're thinking about regional advocacy, it's, it would be a really good idea to circle back around also because I remember a year ago or so when I was talking to Andy Steinberg about this, and I'm going to be provincial and talk with an Amherst hat on, not just a regional. Unfortunately, <laughs> Andy and I didn't talk about how this would affect Shootsbury, Leverett, and Cullum. Um, so we, I'd, I'd love to know. But I did hear how it affected Amherst. And it turns out if you took a straight implementation of some of the Chapter 70 reform items, they weren't as favorable to Amherst as you might think they'd be. And so it's worth, if in fact there's a possibility some formula is going to be voted, it's probably worth us looking at that again and making sure we can get our advocacy done on that particular issue. In, whether it doesn't, in a way, it doesn't matter. If it moves this session or next <coughs> session, we're still getting our order in the water and sort of pushing whatever we need done. But if particularly there's any chance this thing might move, then my goodness, we want to make sure we got that input in. And uh, since I was otherwise going to talk about the demonstration last week, and I already did, I finally had a chair's report. It's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> like I haven't had one of those. Um, so that's that for that. Uh, any public comments? No. Uh, we waited, though. <laughs> so now, uh, are there any subcommittee updates? Well, can I make a comment? Dude, you made a comment earlier. Can I make I know, another I comment? Go ahead. Two, though. No, no, please. I'll go ahead. I won't do one. No, no, the please. Three you can. You can. Okay. No, I. <laughs> it is you can make one every meeting. They're always welcome. Actually, this one. This one's not so funny. I just want to remind the sure. committee that. Um, Shootsbury is really hurting when it comes to the internet and using the Google Classroom. And it, there's, there's actually parents that still can't open up the superintendent's update, weekly update. You can get the email, but when you click on the link, you, it'll just, the spinning beach ball of doom will appear, and that's that. Mm -hmm. So I just, and I've received a few phone calls. I spoke, I let Dr. Morris know about this earlier, but that there are homework assignments that are being given out that Shootsbury students just can't do when there's two or three students from 
Amherst Pelham and Leverett in a group, and they're trying to do a group chat, and they're like FaceTiming and doing the written work at the same time. Shutesbury students can do the written work, but they can't see or hear the FaceTime. Thank you. Well. Are there any, yes? Um, subcommittee updates? That's what I was going to move to, yeah. I can make a couple. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gun shy now. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the policy subcommittee has met, um, and we, we do have multiple policies ready for first reads, so that can go on a future agenda as soon as you would like. Um, the audit subcommittee met tonight and um, went over the audit with our auditors, um, and that was very good process. Um, they pointed out a few um, a few small things, um, suggestions, but overall um, expressed that um, it's we're in good shape and that um, working with the, the finance director and the business offices goes really well. It's a good process. Did you want to add anything about that? OPEB liabilities are that's, um, yes, that's a good point. like disturbing, basically. If you ever look at, I mean, the pension liabilities, I guess we're on a 12-year schedule to be um, resolved, but if you look at other post-employment benefits, it primarily means um, retiree health care. It's, uh, this isn't you know, remotely unique. In fact, it's actually extraordinarily common mm -hmm. to have unfunded pension uh, post-employment benefit liabilities, but um, it's high. It's like $30 million, and it may be restated next year to be as high as $65 million based on um, full projections of those costs. So. Uh, it's one of those topics that, uh, again, should occasionally be revisited, even though, again, what we're doing is not any different to what others are doing. In fact, we're actually um, we're ahead of many districts in trying to deal with this, but it's a sobering topic. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other subcommittee updates? Seeing none, uh, we'll go to the superintendent's update. Sure. And I'll be brief tonight. So uh, yesterday I was able to join uh, Luis Soria, uh, who is the Chief Academic Officer in Holyoke, Jordana Harper, former Amherst teacher, um, and Amherst student when she was younger, actually. Uh, interesting enough, who's the Greenfield Superintendent. Uh, we were at Mount Holyoke, uh, and we were on a panel with Mount Holyoke students about raising your voice, teacher advocacy, and leadership. It's greatly enjoyable. I, I miss teaching tremendously, um, and so it was a small opportunity to be involved in an academic setting. And the number of questions, you know, high-level questions that were interesting uh, was fantastic. And then ironically, it's a weird week, academia. So I was also in a, um, you might have remembered for Amherst School members, there was one meeting in particular where we had a whole lot of Amherst College students come and a second meeting where s some came back. And so I came and, and visited that class today just for a half hour, just as they were interested to follow up on something that happened at Amherst meeting. Um, but it's really, it reminds me our, f our good fortune to live in an area with higher education institutions close and the level of interactions and questions they had. They, they had a lot of questions actually on some, they asked what was on the agenda tonight and they had a lot of very strong thoughts about the marijuana dispensary locations topic and even though they, that wasn't what we were theoretically <laughs> supposed to talk about because they were talking about that meeting, they, um, they had, yeah, they were surprised. Many of them are not from Massachusetts and um, had some, had some, uh, no, I won't go into that conversation, but it was very interesting. Um, I'm not going to do much of an update on the walkout activities because I think uh, it's already been covered by Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Nakajima's comments. I completely agree with what they said. Um, our students were fantastic and incredibly responsible. And, you know, say, you know, there's a couple, new, couple uh, news stations both here and then in Eastern Mass that contacted me. And there was, uh, with a couple of them, there was such concern of what the students would do, and all of our concern was to make sure the students were able to do what they wanted to do safely and about external. So it was the juxtaposition of what the media was trying to cover and what we were spending our time doing, uh, both Mr. Jackson and myself and students, uh, was just, it was, no, it was noteworthy to me that uh, our concern were, was not on the students and walking to town and 
what they would do was making sure they were able to do it safely and peacefully, um, and that you know, if there was any counter protesters, we would be supportive of the students. And yet, um, people wanted a different narrative on it, and I I just find that interesting, so I wanted to note that. Uh, finally, uh, we got a lovely I got a lovely invitation that I, I was asked to share with you. Um, Dr. King, John B. King, who was the Secretary of Education under Obama, the last one that was you know, Arnie Duncan started and he finished. I've met him. He's an incredibly impressive person, uh, a real passionate advocate for integration, uh, speaking some from his personal life experience as well as his professional life experience. He was also the kind of our version of the commissioner, um, but in New York State before he went on to this role at the federal um, level. So he's doing a public presentation up the road at UMass for the College of Education. Um, and everyone in the public, but everyone here is invited. And I think it'll be an excellent opportunity to hear his perspective on what the Department of Education was doing when he was there, what has changed, um, and what he sees as, you know, as the title indicates, what the future, what direction does he see public education going in? So I wanted to share it. Uh, if anyone wants to hang out on a Wednesday afternoon uh, over there, um, I. We'll be racing over from a session, uh, information session at the elementary level, but uh, I do plan to attend as well. So, again, I'll try to keep things brief. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item of business, I think we might have to defer. Um, so I wonder. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was so, going to take the I was going to take the marijuana dispensary location this one next. Right. Yeah. So the Since the town town employee who's going to do some orienting with us is right. present. So just want to okay. make sure that's clear to the so, committee. Okay. You good. Uh, okay. Is there any introduction you'd like to offer on item two? Yeah. Okay. So um, this and is just to be clear for the public and for the, for the committee, if you're just catching up to what's going on, uh, I don't see Mr. Bechtol present to do his presentation on the sabbatical. So therefore, we just take out a turn and take item number two, and then when he arrives, we can take him when he arrives, which is, which is all good, right? Everyone's good. Yeah. Proceed. Sure. So this is a concern that's come. Uh, Mr. Jackson and I have spoken about multiple times, uh, and certain committee members have raised with me, uh, given the legal change in the Commonwealth as it relates to uh, the legality of marijuana, what is the connection to the distance between marijuana dispensaries uh, and our public schools. It's something that's come up at superintendent meetings that I've been at, including recently, like last Friday morning. Um, it's an ongoing concern that educators are expressing, not about the challenging the legal, the, the referendum, but the implementation of the referendum and how it relates to our schools. We happen to have a high school and middle school to a lesser extent, but a high school that's located right off downtown. Uh, it's not off in the woods somewhere, uh, but it, it is close to a commercial industry. And so I reached out to Mr. Kravitz, who's the Economic Development Officer for the Town of Amherst, and I want to share my appreciation for him catching me up pretty quickly on some complex work that work the town has been involved with based on town meeting votes, uh, future town meeting votes, actually this coming spring. Um, and I think he can start us off. I, I asked him to share just a five to seven minute orientation to how we get here, where we are, and what's coming. Wonderful. Welcome, Mr. Kravitz. Hi, Jeff Kravitz, uh, the Economic Development Director for the Dow. So, uh, as Dr. Morris mentioned, I'll briefly talk about four things that I think would be helpful. First is the status and locations of medical marijuana dispensaries with letters of support from the select board, the results of the fall 2017 town meeting, the marijuana-related articles on this upcoming town meeting, and then briefly my understanding of what the licensing process is, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, so the select board... <laughs> the select board issued four letters of support prior to recreational marijuana uh, ballot question passing. One was for GTI, which their location is 169 Meadow Street. They've received a provisional certificate of registration from the Department of Public Health, um, a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals, and a host community agreement uh, signed with the town last Thursday, I believe. Um, Mass Alternative Care is the second one. They're located at 55 University Drive. They have a provisional certificate of registration and a special permit from the ZBA, but no host community agreement yet. 
Um, Mass Medicum at 80... Just the acronym, just because everyone may not be familiar with uh, did I, zoning board. Uh, ZBA. ZBA, Zoning Board of Appeals. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Mass Medicum at 85 University Drive have a provisional, uh, provisional certificate of registration from the Department of Public Health, a special permit from the uh, special permit hearing scheduled for this Thursday, um, and no host community agreement, and Happy Valley Ventures at 422 Amity Street, which is currently Rafters, um, a provisional certificate of registration, a signed host community agreement, but no special permit, and currently not scheduled to have a hearing yet. So at the last fall town meeting, we had four marijuana related articles that were passed. One is the adoption of a 3% local option tax on the retail sales of adult use marijuana. Uh, another article was the adoption of prohibition um, on public consumption of marijuana. Any place in public, you can't eat an edible, drink an infused drink, smoke, vaporize, all forms of um, consumption. We also, town meeting also set a limit of eight recreational marijuana retail establishments in Amherst and passed zoning to allow recreational marijuana retail establishments in basically all the locations that rec uh, medical marijuana dispensaries would be allowed except Office Park and Professional Research Park where the zoning subcommittee felt that a retail shop wasn't appropriate for the zoning. So in this upcoming town meeting, there are three marijuana-related articles, two I consider technical amendments. One is a clarification in the zoning bylaw. The language could be read that um, it says you can't have more than eight recreational marijuana retailers and doesn't specify retail locations. So one retailer could have 15 locations, which is not what we wanted. Um, so just a technical amendment to to say what we wanted it to say. The second is to remove the words not-for-profit from our definitions in our, in our bylaw regarding um, medical marijuana treatment centers and off-site medical marijuana dispensaries. The recreational marijuana law allowed these companies to, or nonprofits to convert to for-profit status. So we figure we'll just remove that language from our um, zoning so that's not a restriction and what the state says is okay is okay. And then a fairly significant amendment to the zoning bylaw, the Cannabis Control Commission issued final regulations um, about a week, a week and a half ago um, that listed all sorts of different types of marijuana establishments, uh, retail locations, cultivation, craft cultivation, micro businesses, transportation, marijuana transporters. Um, they did not do social consumption, which is sort of on site, like a bar um, where you would consume marijuana. And they did not do delivery only. They postponed regulations. We are including those definitions and just putting no across the board in all zones in case the regulations change before the next town meeting um, so that we are covered and it won't happen until we're ready for it to happen. Um, so finally the licensing process as I understand it. The first step for any retail marijuana establishment or um, non-medical mm -hmm. marijuana use is to sign a host community agreement with the town um, and conduct a community outreach meeting that they can't even apply to the state. The state will say, you haven't done that yet, your application is not complete, go back to the municipality and get those things done. Then they would apply to the Cannabis Control Commission. After the Cannabis Control Commission says, yes, you have a complete application. They will send it to us. We will review the location, um, anything in there that would be a violation of our bylaws. And if there is a violation, we go back to the Cannabis Control Commission and say, here's the problem with this application. Um, it is not clear whether the Cannabis Control Commission has to say, OK, fix this, or you're disqualified, or what happens then. but. That is part of the process. The state then grants the provisional license or denies it. Uh, if the provisional license is granted, the applicants would come back 
Um, for a special permit, there are also a few areas and uses that we, uh, we are proposing to allow um, marijuana by site plan review, which is a by right use. Um, and it's only for research and testing facilities, not for any sort of retail locations. Everything else, cultivation, retail, manufacturing, would have to go through the special permit process. Um, if they receive a special permit or site plan review approval, then the, before they could open, the state would have to do a final inspection and issue a final license. Happy to answer questions. Okay, well, let's pause you to see if there are any questions. <laughs> that was a lot. Yeah. But thank you very much. One very easy one. 169 Meadows, where is that? Uh, the old auction barn, uh, right west of 116, coming think, from yeah, North Amherst. <laughs> and um, so, so to kind of roll this up, the, the first time, the first date that a recreational marijuana establishment could apply for a license to open up shop downtown, that would be like in a couple weeks? It would be, uh, that, that's the earliest possible time, yes. The town has not signed any host community agreements for recreational use. All the ones that I mentioned were for medical use. So we would have to do that first. So I had a question. You said, you said that, um, that there could be no retail establishment except for in an area that was otherwise zoned for, I guess, medical marijuana, what you think? No. What I was trying to say, yeah. I don't know if I was successful. Or I heard you wrong. I mean, it's possible. That basically where retail was allowed are the same zones that medical was allowed. Okay. I think that was what I was trying to yeah. say. Okay. Um, how, do you have any idea how close those current zones are to schools? Yes. So probably the, the closest or, or area where it would be closest to, I believe, any school is um, the Triangle Prey Street area. Like that way. Um, yes, so I could talk for a moment about the buffer, if that would be helpful. So the... the well, just to clarify first yeah. off, you mean, you mean like where uh, you know, the, the Kendrick Place building is and where Primo's Pizza is and stuff? Yes, and amateur I'm trying to be, analysis. Trying to be incredibly, like I know I'm being boring, but if you remember how like you give people directions, you say take a. You don't say take a left on Gray Street. You say see that you'll see a Burger King on your left. Take a left. <laughs> I'm sort of doing it that way to try to make sure if I'm orienting myself correctly, we're talking about the same thing. Yes, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yes, okay. yes, uh, around the Kendrick Place in that area. Okay. Would be the closest. Okay, and then please do talk about what you said you, the. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 buffer, zone, yes, the buffer zone, the, um, the town instituted a 300-foot buffer from any K-12 through school, daycare, uh, I believe church, and place where children regularly congregate. Um, currently, the buffer is measured from the marijuana use to the closest point of the building containing the use that triggers the buffer. So we would measure the buffer for the high school probably from the corner of the gym, I think is the closest point to that area of town. Um, and 300 feet would leave you at probably the track. <laughs> um, however, the buffer is also from any non-mixed-use building that contains residences. So there are a number of houses on Cottage Street and Triangle Street that provide a buffer for, for the high school as well, and it's 300 feet from those buildings. Okay. Um, I think actually Ms. Adonis was next, then um, Ms. Dominic Hayes and Mr. Dominic. Um, so I was wondering about the the size of these establishments, and, and basically, I guess the real question is really about the number of, of customers. Or, um, you know, normally when I'm when I'm thinking of a place that is either selling retail or for medical use, um, I'm thinking about the traffic of, of people that are coming in and out, right, and the size of the parking lot, and you know how many people might be milling about out front or anything like that. Has any of that been considered? 
in the discussion around the physical establishments? Not to my knowledge, but it is part of the discussion that will happen before uh, any special permit is granted. They have to do a traffic study. They have to talk about how many people that they expect, what they're going to do if there is an overflow or a line out the door, how they're going to handle that stuff. That, that's all part of the special permit process. And again, if the Zoning Board of Appeals doesn't feel comfortable with their answers, they're free not to grant a special permit for that use at that location. Follow-up question? Sure. Um, and so the follow-up question would be, you know, if, if an environment happens to be rather chaotic, um, I'm picturing like a bar on a Friday night, right, and you have a bouncer out front that's carting, um, do you, would these establishments have something like that to control the flow of people going in and out of the building in, or, in order to ensure that there's no minors that are being able to go in or sort of, you know, undo activity? Yes, their, their state licenses are, are require them to check everybody's ID, um, to have a system for checking ID, to have security personnel who are trained to identify fake IDs, um, and I believe they would risk losing their license if, if it was found. The state regulations create, for lack of a better term, a secret shopper program, just like with tobacco, where they will send, try to send minors in to buy it to see how good the security is. Um, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't think that they are going to turn people away. But I know for medical, they had to have a secure waiting area for patients, and then they <coughs> that there's no product there, and then they bring them back when they have time for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. I'm not. I don't think it's going to be the same for recreational. Um, but I do know that before you can get into the part of the building where you make your purchase they will check your ID. So there's, I think there's going to be a waiting area where they check IDs and then you go through an, a secure door once you've been verified that your age is over, is 21 or over, and then you can go in. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I do. Um, what are the hours? Is there a cap to these shops? Yes, uh, they can't be open before 8 a.m. They can't be open after 8 p.m. Is that our Amherst local? rules ordinance or I believe they're that's both in the state regulations and in our bylaws okay so, um, so talked about the buffer at the places that children regularly congregate is that a technical term that defines only specific establishments or is that interpretable based on activity so that that is a, a legacy of the recreational uh, of the medical marijuana that was included in the Department of Public Health regulations, and so we incorporated it into our bylaw. And I will admit I was not here when we wrote that bylaw, so I'm not completely sure. Um, but we have had discussions of what that means. My current understanding is if there is a regularly programmed class, for example, at Amherst Media Makerspace, where kids 6 to 12 go every Wednesday night. I would consider that a place where people regularly congregate. Our children regularly congregate. Thank you. Ms. Hazard, Ms. Mary. Um, you mentioned that um, a public hearing is part of the special permit process. Is that what you said? Or th there's some sort of a... I believe there is a public hearing as part of the special permit. You said there was some, there was some sort of... Uh, public outreach meeting. Public outreach meeting. Yes. Yeah. Could you talk about what that looks like? I but you don't know. One, what the so I don't know. Be. I know that it's in the the Cannabis Control Commission's regulations. It's incumbent upon the applicants to provide evidence, and it has to be duly noticed. Uh, I think they have to send letters to a butters to notify them of the meeting, um, and the the purpose is to get community feedback and hopefully incorporate that into their site plans. Okay. okay. Ms. Murray? Um, I just want to go back to the. The boundary, the buffer zone again mm -hmm. for a minute. Um, so, to, to see if I understand it correctly, it it's the building that triggers it because it seems weird to me that the school grounds in their entirety wouldn't provide the, the jumping off point for the 300 foot buffer. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> the the state regulations between the draft version that we were 
issued in Mar uh, in December and the final that were issued in March, um, the state actually switched that up on us. They uh, had sort of a similar measurement as we do. I think they actually did use to use or building to building. <coughs> And then in the final regulations, they said, and this distance is measured from lot line to lot line. Um, <coughs> so that, that is currently what their regulations say, but they also say that the municipality ha can lower the, the buffer. They have a 500 foot buffer as, as the default if a municipality doesn't choose a different one. I feel like I'm more confused now. So you're saying the most recent state regulations or yes. this, um, said lot line, like boundary line to boundary line? Um, when you say lot line, you mean? Property line. Property line to property line. And it's 500 feet, not 300 feet? Yes. So wouldn't that supersede what we have locally? The regulations also allow the municipality to lower that distance. Okay. Is there any thought of changing it to conform with the state definition? There, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I I'm guess not trying to put you on the spot. No, no, no. I'm just I, asking. So again, the the recreational bylaw sort of was based on the medical one, which I was not around for. My understanding is that the reason it was lowered or shortened was because otherwise none of these businesses could operate in downtown given the number of churches and mm. community establishments um, that serve children and I believe the zoning subcommittee and planning board felt like this might be a business that would be appropriate for uh, a location downtown. Mm. Uh, this down here? I just want to make sure if anyone else has any questions. They saw them. Okay, um, when the zoning subcommittee and the, the planning board were going through these regulations, um, w was there any community outreach or outreach to school organizations or the school administration or school committee to discuss some of the implications of the zoning? Uh, the select board had meetings, the planning board had public hearings. I am not aware of any specific outreach um, to the school committee or for the school specifically. Thank you. Uh, okay. Oh, Ms. Ms. Ramos. Um, I guess the natural next question is, is, is there an opportunity still for public input and or committee input on this particular zoning question? Yes. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Tomorrow night, there's going to be a hearing. Uh, the planning board is, doing, is having a hearing. So there is an opportunity uh, to comment on this. Um, I, I think that part of the reason that the buffer zone wasn't changed is, is we didn't hear a lot of complaints about medical and felt that there was going to be a lot of confusion and questions at town meeting about this. And so if people were comfortable with the medical buffer, we would keep it the same for recreational, but I think that um, certainly your comments would be welcome tomorrow night. I think the planning board has one public hearing scheduled for 7.05, and then this one is scheduled at 7.15. Um, I don't think it's going to start right at 7.15, but... <laughs> We're familiar uh, with that. <laughs> <laughs> One question, um, how does the buffer zones and regulations um, in regards to zoning compare to the use for um, selling or serving alcohol? Um, that is a good question. I am not sure. Um, I, I know the select board is the local licensing authority for that. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware of what the regulations are uh, zoning-wise for selling alcohol. I, I don't know that there is a buffer. Um, there might be specifically a, away from schools, um, but beyond that, what's, what's fascinating to me is that it's just the desirability of having the debate or discussion or finding a way to, before anything's licensed and open, to, to make sure that 
the public is as aware as possible of the decisions. And I know you're doing that, but I'm just saying, and that the committee or others or parents or any teachers, anyone else, have an opportunity to weigh in because um, actually what Ms. Kosinski just brought up was something that was sort of rattling around in my head was that um, even though I can understand and I can appreciate concerns or sensitivities around opening up retail establishments that would sell recreational marijuana, and I know that at least back a long time ago, there was some controversy over the fact that where there's a, I think it's a dentist office or something, right on the edge of the track over mm -hmm. that way, uh, right on the edge of Triangle Street, there used to be a convenience store that, and that also sold cigarettes and stuff like that and, and you know, dip, chewing tobacco. And so there was a controversy quite a long time ago about whether it was appropriate to have a convenience store that proximate to high school students that might almost seem like it's selling to high school students and does that make any sense and is that a good thing around tobacco? But as a practical matter, if you go farther than that, you have, the, you have one convenience store that currently has some sort of limited liquor license to sell beer and wine as well as multiple tobacco products right on the edge of that area. And if you go into the parking lot to the side, you have the pub and whatever that bar is now that used to be called Charlie's, and around the corner, Cousins Market that also sells beer and wine and tobacco. And my, my point only on this is that it would make for an interesting discussion and debate as a community around how do we treat these products, how do we treat the legal, responsible, and appropriate sale of those products, and then how do we deal with an environment in which we're going to have um, people, you know, young people who are not of age, some of whom are nearly of age, but they're not of age, and others who are much younger who are going to be kicking around areas where we know they're going to be proximate to these establishments. And how do we do that in a way that makes people feel, feel safe? I know, I know you're the, I shouldn't say this on camera because I feel bad for you, but like you're the genius and the point person, I think, for our town on this subject, and you've done a remarkable job, I think. But, it, but it's a really hard discussion for a lot of people on that. Oh, was, was there any Go comments? Ahead. Okay, so I, I had just uh, one or two comments and a question. I want to give Mr. Jackson if you'd like to come up, if that's yeah, okay with sure. the chair to talk as principal of the high school. So I think on the alcohol, I don't know the zoning, but I do know that when there's an alcohol establishment that's, and I don't know the exact neighbor, you know, uh, how many feet it is, but we do get a note, we get noticed both at the school level and the district level that um, a establishment that plans to sell alcohol um, and a request for public comments on that establishment. So just something to keep in mind, well, some of the other things may not align, I actually think that's really useful. Um, and I think it was referenced, um, Im implied in some of the comments that if there was an establishment that was gonna be within a certain range of the school, that the school department would get noticed and it could be shared with the school committee mm -hmm. so that people could be aware of, of that. I know we're not there yet, but just as a process piece, I think it'd be really useful. Um, so I think um, tomorrow morning, meet with our administrative team, and, and I'll be frank, it's trying to look at our health curriculum. How do we look at um, a year from now where potentially there'd be significant numbers of retailers um, selling marijuana and not playing out into the referendum and the vote and, and all that, but just what's the impact on our students? Um, and how do we think through how that looks like? Uh, if you see pictures of Colorado, um, and I'm not suggesting it'll be the same here, but looking at another state where there's been marijuana at some level was legalized, um, there's lots of pictures that look like candy stores. Um, it's not mom and pop shops um, that I see images of when I look at images and have read about Colorado. It's very savvy retailers who are doing, you know, the work of capitalism, right? And however I feel about it, however people feel about it, that, that's the reality. So how do we as a school district be in front of that and make sure that we're sharing accurate and relevant information with our students so that they're aware of um, things that used to be illegal that are now not legal for them but are sanctioned by our commonwealth. And so I guess my question is a long-winded way of getting to a question, which is in terms of the 3% tax, has been any determination of how that will get um, that's just going to go to the town coffers? Is it earmarked? I know in certain states, for instance, that legalize gambling, certain percentage of the tax that comes with gambling goes to programs to support um, folks who struggle with, have an addiction with that. And I don't know if there's been any thought to where that tax goes and is a certain percentage either going to education or to work on uh, folks who are struggling with addiction issues. Uh, or is it undetermined right now or is it clear that it's just going into town coffers to be distributed uh, in the general funds? 
Yeah, currently it's going uh, into the general fund. I think I'd also like to note that the host community agreement, at least the ones that we've signed, have a uh, 3% uh, of gross sales, so similar to the local option tax that has to be directly related to the impact of having uh, either a marijuana, a medical dispensary or a recreational establishment. Um, so if there are additional costs to educate students or something like that, um, educational programs, I think it is certainly part of what we were thinking that that money would, would be used for. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Denling, and then an opportunity Mr. Judge for one. Yeah, so um, I'm anxious to hear from uh, our principal uh, if, if, if he's able to speak tonight. Um, you know, since we've kind of shifted from Q&A to discussion mode, I, I just want to be very straightforward that I, I'm very concerned about the implementation of this bylaw. And, um, you know, for a little self-reflection, I, I kind of feel like our committee has dropped the ball on this in terms of paying attention to the timeline. Um, I think the focus on the number of feet in the buffer, whether it's 300 or 500 or 476, kind of misses the point. Um, we have a population of students, both from our high school and from our middle school, 12-year-olds, who normally, in large groups, after school, go downtown and hang out downtown. In fact, <laughs> and I know this because, you know, my kids went through this experience. It could be actually kind of a, a positive coming-of-age experience. For a lot of kids, it's their first taste of independence. You know, school gets out, and they go down, they get a slice of Antonio's, and you're texting them the whole time to see if they're all right, and you pick them up, you know, a half an hour later, and... Uh, and, and it goes on like that for six years, and and now we're talking about anywhere from Kendrick Place down to Amherst College, that entire nexus of our, the center of our community, opening up to recreational marijuana. And I don't want to sound alarmist as if I'm going to paint a cartoon caricature that I know is going to come to pass, but to me that's exactly the point. None of us knows exactly what any town in Massachusetts is going to look like after this law has passed, after these shops have come up with what Dr. Morris very rightly points out are going to be national corporations that know exactly how to market this, um, this product. Um, and, and so to be able to say what an appropriate relationship is of uh, uh, a distance from the schools, and also to say what the content of our curriculum should be. Because, you know, we're, in, in Amherst, we're, this isn't Nancy Reagan. We're not drugs are bad, drugs are good. You know, we are a student empowerment approach. We, we want to uh, give students the information, and we want to contour it to the environment that they're going to have to be making these decisions in. And if we don't know what that environment looks like yet, it's very difficult, I think, to construct a, a great appropriate curriculum uh, to train, and have time for people to be trained in it, for the students to respond to it so that it's effective. Um, so, you know, that's one point. The other thing that's happening at the same time, as you've probably read in the news, and our community is, is no different, uh, there's a serious problem with, uh, with vaping um, of, of multiple substances with teenagers these days. And, you know, for those of you not up on the latest drug paraphernalia, you know, there's a thing called jeweling, and this paraphernalia is getting harder to detect in terms of its size, in terms of its odor. And uh, so to educate kids about uh, the liquid form that various drugs take, about the edible um, marketing, is, is concerning. And so you take all that and you throw it into what has been classified as, so Amherst has been classified as an area of disproportionate impact when it comes to the marijuana law. And that's because we have the fifth most impacted community for marijuana-related arrests according to the report for the impact of drug and marijuana arrests on local communities in Massachusetts. And we, we know the reason. We have 24,000 college students right next to our high school. Um, so we have our downtown right next to our high school and middle school, right next to tens of thousands of individuals very excited for the legalization of this product. And then they're going to have to make a geographical choice of where they are going to go to purchase this, this product in our town to the University Drive section, which takes them away from our downtown and away from our schools, or to downtown where everybody is, is, already is. And so I'm, I'm just opening up a number of issues that I feel like have not been adequately conversed at our community, haven't been adequately conversed um, in, in our uh, uh, community <coughs> or committee, and uh, it leaves me very concerned given the late date uh, that, that we're not prepared for this. 
So, um, before I go to Ms. Tommy Cage, I don't know if you have anything you want to say? Um, I don't know if it's a, the appropriate time for the, um, ask Mr. Jackson to share his thoughts, <coughs> or you'd prefer to wait. Uh, no, it's fine. Mr. Dominic, Yeah, I just want to briefly say, you know, I, I just want us to take a deep breath and, and keep things in perspective. I think we passed uh, some policy around substance abuse um, not too long ago, and I think the real concern should be opiate, you know, the opiate crisis, and, and, um, and I, I know that the Northwestern District Attorney's Office has done um, conferences, brought schools together, um, safe school summits and all of that. And I think SPIFI is another mm -hmm. coalition through the Collaborative for Educational Services. So there are, are um, I'm sure, districts struggling with this issue right now. But I, I just want to keep you know, the whole thing into perspective. And I think you know, like death through um, you know, painkillers and all of that are, are a serious issue. Um, and so we should try to keep things in, in perspective in that in that sense that we you know where our resources and our focus and our attention should be. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wallace? Um, I, I would agree with that and I also think that we you know we, we are walking a fine line because we also don't want to have a community that is criminalizing um, marijuana use and in particular because we understand the, the differences in the different kinds of drugs and a lot of people, there's you know, there's varying degrees of tolerance for one particular drug over another, but I think creating an environment of fear is is worse for our students and worse for our community. You know, from my personal interest, it's about ensuring that there are adequate measures in place for these particular shops because they are kind of like candy shops. I have an aunt that lives outside of Denver and Colorado, and you know, have taken a stroll around those neighborhoods and. It's, seen what they, they, you know, the way that they market and what they do. Um, and they, be, they do become very attractive to different members of the community. But, um, you know, that aside, I think ensuring that we have adequate education in our schools and that there are measures being taken in these facilities to ensure that underage, um, you know, shoppers aren't there and aren't taking advantage of any potential chaos. I mean, my concern with you know, medical establishment versus a retail establishment is that the volume of traffic for a retail establishment presumably will be a lot higher than for a medical establishment. There's a lot of stigma around medical use of marijuana. And so you know, I think when that is removed in the, medical, in the retail environment, um, the potential is for just a lot more shoppers. When you have a lot more shoppers, you get more confusion and all that kind of thing. So I do appreciate. Um, your being here tonight and, and you know walking us through some of this, I do think it's important for us to have a voice, um, you know, and, and we'll plan on going to this planning board meeting tomorrow and um, and expressing some of these thoughts and concerns. Um, and if there's anything that the superintendent has to share, you know, with me, I, you know, I would appreciate it, yeah. uh, just in terms of data or information or anything like that that I can bring. Um, but I would very much like to speak as a committee member and as my as a member, the citizen here in, in town. Um, you know that there are, there are certain measures in place that I think are extremely important, especially for the safety of all of our community members, and just to ensure, from the school perspective, um, that we have those protections in place so that people aren't getting hurt. Yeah, I think that the. Um on a lot of these things, and I actually frankly don't know to the typical disposition of Amherst, I'd actually be interested in knowing from the, the police or from town hall the perspective on how we, apart from the Alcohol and Beverage Control Commission, which undoubtedly sends folks out to do reviews of bars and other retail establishments for alcohol, um, I literally don't know, and I'd love to know the answer actually, of how the town itself orients itself around enforcement of the um, trade in controlled substances, including in this case alcohol and tobacco. Uh, in, in my mind, there are a couple of issues. One issue is, is the sort of the health education, family wellness perspective in which um, it's not immediately clear to me that marijuana, once it's legalized, is taxonomically different than someone who is uh, involved in uh, an abusive relationship with other um, controlled substances. And, and so to me, if you're looking at a spectrum of wellness, the question is how are we engaging in that spectrum of wellness and supporting students in terms of their lives within families and communities, and then also themselves and their education and awareness. The easy answer, which is sort of the classic traditional answer, 
is that it's illegal for young people to be engaging, underage people to be engaging in any of these substances, and that's sort of an obvious bottom line. But then the question is, what do you do to help with education, awareness, and support, knowing that we live in an, in an imperfect world? And so there's one role which the community has and the schools have to engage in that question. And then there's another one which I was referencing a moment ago around how the community also engages in, in enforcing rules around who's allowed to be in these shops, um, how do you know who's in these shops, what are the entrances like to them, uh, you know, in, ter in terms of how one can enter and peer around one of these shops. And I think, and I think frankly, that question, again, I'm not sure that that's tremendously different whether you're selling tobacco-related equipment or um, alcoholic beverages or whether you're selling marijuana because in any of those situations, you would hope that there's actually uh, a profound level of oversight, security, and responsibility around the engagement of minors with any of these substances. And so that's essentially on us within the so-called, I don't usually use this term, but the so-called adult community to figure out how we police ourselves in, in regard to this. I do think it's something that requires probably a more robust public conversation because I'd agree with Ms. Ardonias that um, when you think of a medical dispensary, and I haven't been to one, but I'm assuming that a medical marijuana dispensary like one for controlled narcotics that, that are available through prescription, there's some level of security involved in these facilities that make them just sort of, again, a different animal than going into a retail establishment in which logic dictates that you're probably making, at least for people who are of age, at a desirable and enjoyable environment where for someone who's partaking of illegal activity, it's probably marketed in a way that seems fun, right? I mean, enticing in a way that um, my assumption is a medical marijuana, as you described, sort of locked area and then some relationship to the purveyors of it. Um, that, that just has a different feel to probably how people would engage and react that would likely create a different relationship to the public around where you'd want one facility and where you'd want the other. But in my, in my mind, to me, the question of wellness and education um, across a spectrum of potential and known abuses, and I agree with Ms. Dominic Cage that when we're thinking of that, the opioid epidemic is so incredibly pervasive and severe. And in fact, as far as I can tell, the number one gateway to minors to be abusing drugs in our society today is if they have some kind of sports injury or other accident that gets them into the medical system to use uh, prescribed medications. And that that's a profound challenge and gateway. So I think my point on this is to me the wellness question and the support around this is a profound one. Marijuana is in the mix for that, but it's actually a much more profound conversation. On the town side, I'm actually really interested in knowing more about enforcement, regulation, and oversight of the, of the establishment so that we know that even if, even if we have um, popular underage who come uptown and seem enticed by a shop, the question is can they get in and is there any oversight to ensure that they're not able to acquire that uh, substance? And I'd hope they'd be able, that the answer would be yes. I'm sure the answer is yes, but I hope it would be. Mr. Kravitz? Not going to answer your question directly, but I, w I did want to respond with a couple points. Um, there are limitations on advertising and the outside of buildings. Um, there can't be any marijuana leaves, any indication that marijuana is located inside. There can't be any window displays of products, whether edibles or flowers or other types of things that are visible from the outside. Everything has to be somewhat enclosed. Um, any sort of advertisement that goes out, um, for example, if they wanted to do it in the newspaper, they have to project that at least 85% of the people who are going to read it are above 21. Um, same with billboards or radio advertisements. Um, so I think that, that there are some state controls as far as enticing people to come in and making it fun. Um, and then I will say that I have been to, um, I, I was in Eugene, Oregon, another college town for the International Town Gown Association Conference. Oregon has also legalized, so I took the opportunity to travel to some of these dispensaries. Um, I don't think that their regulations are as strong as ours. In the college newspaper, it said, come to 
it was Jamaica Joel's and bring your student ID and get 10% off. That wouldn't be allowed here. Um, but a, as far as how you actually enter the facility where you can see the product, all of them had, you know, they, they checked my ID, they said, okay, you're over 21, you can go in and see. And so that was the process consistently out there. Um, and from what I know, it, and the one that I know about is a, is a medical dispensary here, but they're planning on co-locating a, a recreational facility if they're allowed. And you come into a secure room, somebody's gonna check your ID. If you're a medical patient, you go left. If you're a recreational client, then you would go right, but you can't go into either of them until you've gone through the security checkpoint. Um, and I am happy to confirm what the security regulations are and uh, pass along Dr. Morris the full 90 pages of regulations <laughs> in case anybody wants to dig. It's also, by the way, amherstma.gov slash marijuana has a lot of information, including links to the regulations, links to municipal guidance that was issued by the Cannabis Control Commission on Friday. Um, and so I know that there's a short timeline between tonight and tomorrow night, um, but that, that is a hopefully a resource, and I'm happy to answer questions via email as well if, if you want further. I appreciate that. I think we've more than exhausted our time for this item tonight. Um, I'd love to have Principal Jackson say anything if he wants to. Sure. Um, so, lots of ways in on this question. I'll start. <coughs> Here's where I'll start. So, on the first floor of this building, if you walk the perimeter, there are 28 exterior first floor doors. All of which, if you push on them, they take you outside. <laughs> See where I'm going? <laughs> right. So it is impossible in the course of a school day to have an adult stationed in front of 28 different doors and absolutely secure the entire student population. Right. And I tell you that because the point, the point that I want to make is that if there is a, if, if, if here's some assumptions I make about, and Jeff, I don't know your job. Right. Bless you. Uh, <laughs> uh, some assumptions I make is that marijuana is a gateway drug, and it's closer to the reality of adolescence than the opioids are. Um, we have Ruth Poti, who's the foremost um, expert in the Valley. Uh, it's her mission, it's her passion to talk about uh, substance abuse, and she was here two years ago and talked to 60 parents and stated unequivocally that it's a gateway drug. Not for everybody, but anybody who gets the heroin starts with marijuana. Right? So I have this deep stake in forestalling kids' engagement with that. Um, so I appreciate hearing from Jeff all the restrictions that are built in on the advertisement because like uh, with the superintendent, I fear um, uh, when the marketing machine really gets in high gear, the ways in which uh, marijuana-based products would be advertised, and it can only be to create a solid customer base for the rest of their lives. Um, but I assume even if there's not fancy advertising on the outside, people will know where it is, it'll, it'll attract a certain clientele, it'll be busy, and it'll just raise the energy in town about the accessibility of marijuana. So if I'm a 16-year-old and I've stepped in, I'm curious, or I want to step in and there are 28 doors, right, I can get down and back really fast because I just text my buddy during lunch and he waits by the door and he lets me back in. Right? And I just I can't I can't frame this in, in any other way than that's a siren song. Right, if it's within some reasonable proximity. And I, I hope, I mean, I, I found it ironic that none of the agreed upon benchmarks of distance worked, or they would all prevent the establishment of a, of a, of a dispensary downtown. And so at some level, we agreed to waive those because we're going to put a dispensary downtown. Um, but from my perspective, understanding adolescence as I do, understanding the allure, the fascination, the seduction that comes with uh, uh, those kinds of things. Um, I can only conclude that for a lot of kids this will be disorienting and it will lead to choices that they wouldn't normally make because they wouldn't have had this degree of opportunity. So I didn't know about this meeting tomorrow night. I think it may be worth taking our conversation on the road, but as an educator, as the person responsible for this building, I would be very concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, so I, I just wanted to, I know I was, uh, you know, passionate in my expression of this concern. Mm -hmm. and It's because it's a significant concern. So I just wanted to clarify a couple things. One, 
I absolutely agree. There is no false equivalency here between marijuana and opioids. Okay? Um, that's, and and if, we're, if we're just going to have a general principle discussion about marijuana laws, I mean, people might be surprised to, to hear, you know, I'm in full support of the decriminalization of marijuana at the national level because of the draconian way in which our federal government imposes sentences and uses it as a wedge to disproportionately disenfranchise people of color and, and, and a number of other groups. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I could go on. So this is about the responsible implementation of a legal substance um, that, that many feel, including myself, is not as dangerous as alcohol in some respects, um, and, and how we do that in the most responsible manner. Um, and, and I know that the phrase gateway drug is, is a reactionary phrase to, to some who have been fighting um, the uh, irresponsible implementation of these laws for, for many years. Um, but I think, um, I think our principal uh, articulated the distinction in an important way in which it's not that every person who uh, takes marijuana becomes addicted to opioids, but the vast majority of people who are addicted to opioids start with marijuana. And when he, and, and when he talked about, you know, Dr. Ruth Poteet, so I was, avail, uh, I was fortunate enough to see the, the, the talk, and one of the key points is that, you know, our brain isn't fully developed until age 25, and the last thing that develops is that executive functioning prefrontal cortex component of the brain, right? And we heard our principal talk about this will lead to decisions that maybe in a different situation uh, our kids might not otherwise be making. And that, that's exactly that kind of, of decision making. And so, you know, when I talk about um, slowing down to have time to responsibly implement a curriculum, it's not so that we can go all Nancy Reagan and say that pot is the same as opioids. It's, it's to empower kids with this information. It's to empower them to be able to read um, a, the, uh, the, uh, the THC level on an edible, to understand how loosely regulated that is in some capacity, to be able to make informed decisions, and, and so that we can give them the tools that they will be most well equipped to resist what our principal is describing as this siren song. So that's, that's where my concern is coming. So we have to wrap this up. Um, we should discuss it at a future meeting as well, and if there are any other comments, I didn't want to accept that off, I was in that direction. Um, the, uh, by the way, I don't want to be misunderstood either. I'm not actually, I, I, think, it, I think the question of what, so an, I'm going to, I'm speaking, I'm going to back up for a second, and I'm going to do this, and the reason I was looking at um, Superintendent earlier, is Mr. Demling's asked to have this on the agenda for probably four or five months, which is why he began his conversation by criticizing us for not having it on the agenda. And I'm not blaming you for that. No, no, I'm not criticizing you. You started off by saying we should have addressed it sooner. And so I'm trying to address that. I'm trying to respond to that comment because you did make that comment, and it's okay you made that comment. And, I'm, and, and it's, it's okay you made that comment. And so I'm just bringing it up because I wanted to give the superintendent an opportunity to respond to why, on some level, why we haven't had it on. We've talked about this before, yeah. why it wasn't, why you're, you're suggesting not having it on. Not when the appropriate, trying to figure out when the appropriate time to talk about it would be. Right. Yeah, and I think um, a couple of things. One is things continue to evolve. Um, I mean, it's not justification, but the information that's being presented, then, is, thank you for coming, Mr. Kravitz, as well, um, continues to evolve. Our work internally continues to evolve as we find out more information. And um, I think for us, it's uh, continually trying to keep up with changes that are happening beyond our control. Um, I think in many communities right now, and I had a conversation with this about West, with Western Mass superintendents on Friday morning, um, it's amazing how different the context is. Um, in some communities, this conversation is the third rail, right? So, you know, I won't name the community, but there's a community where one community member wanted to bring up and, and just it, it just was not something the community is willing to embrace as, as being a topic of conversation. In other communities, uh, there's one that I'm thinking of in particular where the per capita income is incredibly low. Uh, it, the economic development is just is not existent in the community. And to think about preventing people from having jobs that are better paying than the ones that are available or having jobs at all is prevailing information. So I think we as a community have to sort of make sense of uh, we have a new law. We're trying to make sense of how that's going to affect things in Amherst. At this point, there's been no proposal, which I think is the thing that I uh, 
uh, to get it back directly to your question, there's been no proposal to have any dispensary anywhere close to our high school, right? So one of the things that when the chair and I spoke, we looked at where the dispensaries at the time, which is, is consistent with the current time, are located, and they're not near our school, uh, any of our schools. And so as that evolves and as the regulations are coming and if that changes, I think you'll see a very different response from the school department uh, and perhaps from the school <coughs> committee. Uh, I think it feels really different at University Drive Meadow Street than it would in, in downtown Amherst where, you know, not to pick on like Cousins Market just because that, that was referenced as a location. It's not about the purveyors of Cousins Market. Uh, I think that's going to be a really different conversation. So I think for us, trying to find the right place of entry uh, has been a challenge as things have developed, and I actually think this is um, not a terrible place of entry in terms of where we are. We have yet to have a dispensary suggested. I think that's accurate from what I heard from Mr. Kravitz. That's anywhere near our schools, and I think this is the place to start having that conversation with the select board and perhaps a town meeting as there are articles about <coughs> how the committee feels, how the school department feels about opening that door and where that would be located. And I really appreciate hearing about the process, that even if one was suggested, there is an opportunity for the community to become involved and become engaged on a more specific question than where we are today. Mr. Adams? Add one more thing. The law and the regulations do allow for a local licensing process, and we are trying to figure out how to do that, and that would also be another check on if, if school committee felt that, or, or the select board, whoever the licensing authority is, felt that it was too close to the schools, um, they would have discretion to, similar, I think, to a, an alcohol license where the, the town gets some say. Um, we're trying to figure out <laughs> how that works and have not, have not been able to yet and are not aware of a local licensing process in any other municipality that <coughs> we can use as a basis. but. The option is available, and and we're seriously looking. And at Mr. That. Kravitz, you said tomorrow the planning board meeting is what seven or something? Seven. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Well, just, I'm asking, yes. I guess I thought you said it was yes, seven. seven. Okay. I mean, one of the things that I would, I mean, I don't. If we obviously haven't done anything or voted anything as a committee. If there are members of the committee who are inclined to go, and engage with the planning board, frankly, one thing I would welcome knowing is whether there is any conversation as a community as to the desirability of having retail establishments in the downtown. Is that something that's actually under debate or discussion? I mean, I tend to agree that, I tend to agree with the observation that if you don't like having a retail establishment proximate to the schools, and proximate to the schools might go anywhere from here to Burgers, then you, then the question is what do we, what are we even talking about for our downtown? And then how do we have, how do we have a rational conversation? I mean, I don't mean rational in a way that it was being irrational, but I mean, how do we actually map out a discussion that can engage our community, engage different viewpoints, engage perspectives on what the impacts would be, and then make a decision out of that that people would feel um, would be helpful to our community, helpful to our kids, and could actually be passed because you know that can be tough times and tough in our time too, and it, it seems like one of those. To me, it seems like a conversation that is best to find some kind of space where you can enter into the dialogue and and bring obviously facts to the table, but also not immediately bring sort of your back up. Because I can you know I can imagine positions coming in where the people are very on different sides of where they want to go with that, including by the way ones that are strongly in favor. That would, and our community voted so overwhelmingly in favor of this law that I could, I could see some people coming in with the view that they want it to be, if not the Wild West, they want a highly libertarian view of sales. And so to me, it's not a no-brainer that if you come in with a perspective of child and family welfare and sort of thinking of that perspective, that might not actually predominate. There will be a strong position in that favor. But I want to see what I mean. So I mean, I would welcome figuring out or getting feedback for anyone who's going tomorrow about where that's going and what role can the school committee fruitfully play in the future in this discussion. Anyone? anyone? Yes. Um, did you want? If you. Yeah, I just wanted to underscore one of the things Dr. Moore said, which is the changing landscape, and combined with the fact that we have. It's called a permissive bylaw. So if we don't say you can't do it in this zone, then the building commissioner makes a determination of the closest analogous use and then 
puts it there. So um, I, I don't think I would be speaking out of turn to say that we're, we don't think that this is the perfect solution, but we thought it was important to have something, some sort of local regulations in sort of the areas that we thought were appropriate um, given the changing landscape at the state level. Sure. Dr. Morrison, I think yeah. we actually need to move on. Yeah, absolutely. I just, for Mr. Kravitz, and I, I won't, I'm not speaking for the committee, just for myself. Um, I think the three things that, um, just kind of like to concretize things, we had a really robust conversation. Um, so I'm interested in, in having clarity on notification. So if there was a request for a dispensary downtown, how do we get notified particularly? Um, right, so there's one, like, you know, they may have to do some general call out, but that's, uh, I really like the alcohol. The example of the alcohol bylaw, and I'm not exactly sure. I know only what I receive. I don't know what the wording is, but that if there's if there's a place selling alcohol that's somewhere near our school that's new, high school principal gets a letter, I get a letter, I can share that with school committee, and it assures us that because if there's some notice in the Amherst Bulletin or somewhere that we don't see that we don't get it. Not everyone in our, our committee is uh, covers four towns, so it's not just a town of Amherst issue, it's uh, Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, Shootsbury issue, and I think uh, one of the things that we have the capacity to do is to share that with our elected officials, who can then share back with other elected officials, because I also want to note that, sorry, this isn't as short as I thought, um, that three of our town's select boards aren't part of this process, right? So for Leverett, Pelham, and Shootsbury, they're not engaged in this conversation, they're sending kids to a, a school in the town of Amherst and yet their access to be involved in this is very limited. So that's one role schools can play, that we can do that, and elected officials here can bring it back to their school committees, their select boards, um, so that we can have the communication piece, because the thing I don't want to have happen, and this gets to my second point about process, is something happens and it feels really quick and there hasn't been public engagement and dialogue that Mr. Nakajima spoke about. Uh, that will be a huge issue, regardless of the location, but particularly as it relates to schools, um, because we never, what we endeavor uh, tirelessly is that no one says, where did this come from? When did this happen? Um, wherever the outcome is, that people are fully informed, and I think we can assist the town in that way, because I do believe that parents and staff will have strong viewpoints on this matter, um, and will not feel good if they're not um, notified. I think the last thing, and I, under, I, I speak about it a little bit, but I want to underscore it, is that we will need support on the education piece, right? So, you know, not just because we're in tough fiscal times, but because it's a, a changing landscape, and things will look perhaps different a year from now when we're having this conversation than they do now in terms of landscape of, of down, literally the landscape of downtown. And so thinking through that with the town, and I appreciate the perspective of the 3% for impact, it's not just the dollars and cents, uh, there's an element to that, but really thinking through what health education can we do in the schools and what health education does the town want to take on uh, around public engagement on this issue is something that, you know, whether it's Julie Fetterman or that we'd love to partner on. Um, <coughs> again, one aspect is in a course, in a mandatory course that students take in our school district. Another is, what does the community feel about health education more generally? And um, I just want to end by saying we're happy to partner and we look forward to partnering with the health department of the town of Amherst uh, and perhaps the other three towns on how to approach that task. But I do think waiting too long for that uh, is going to be problematic. I think we need to get a little bit ahead of it uh, from where we are at the moment. Great. Uh, we will continue. And uh, item number, we're going to go back to item number one. Uh, one of the more important and um, some of the satisfying things that we do is support sabbatical requests. Um, and we don't always get a chance to hear, I know, we, I know the committee is not always taking the opportunity to hear back um, from people who've enjoyed those sabbaticals about what they've learned and what they've been able to bring back to our district from that experience. <coughs> so with that tone, <laughs> I believe that is, Dr. Morris, is there anything he wants to introduce? I'd Absolutely. welcome that. Yeah, just briefly, um, there's a written report that you all have that Mr. Bechtold has shared, so thank you for your follow-up. And I'll just say in my conversation with Mr. Bechtold when he came back, uh, what I appreciate are two quick things. One is just the level of enthusiasm of not just the learning that happened in London, but the application of the learning that's possible in Amherst based off that. Uh, and the second is that how, how many ideas you had, right? It wasn't like, 
oh, you know, I just, you know, this one thing I want to do, it really was more, as I took, and I think you'll speak to it, uh, much more foundational in terms of the shifts that you see as possible based on the experience. I want to thank the school committee for supporting my recommendation of the sabbatical, Mr. Bentold <coughs> for thinking of the sabbatical and making connections to make it possible, and I look forward to hearing your presentation tonight. Thank you. I wanted to thank you also, uh, Dr. Morris, and the board for supporting this. This has been a really wonderful venture. Um, I also just want to note that I really enjoyed actually listening and hearing the seriousness of the previous conversation. I'm then happy to truncate this. You do have a written report that's way longer than I would present anyway, so um, I can cut to the chase, as it were. <laughs> so. um, to that end, uh, anything that you see on a screen is really supplemental and kind of brief. I would say if you do get <coughs> genuinely interested in, and want a deep dive, that's what this is, but there's also no desire or pressure to, to have to go that far. Um, the proposal for the sabbatical was to meet with a particular company as the primary reason for going, <coughs> uh, an immersive th company called Punch Drunk, uh, to work with both their what I call their kind of adult or kind of general audience arm, their artistic arm, as well as their educational arm, which are shows guided uh, and directed towards schools uh, and other, uh, <coughs> I'd say, uh, non-general demographics like uh, inpatient care and things like that. So I was able to live on both sides of that by participating in the professional work that they were doing for the general public as well as the educational work and the pedagogy that came with that as well. So some of that is reflected in this report as well as some contextual information that's probably not worth going through today. Um, my interest is primarily kind of parsing those two things very quickly, seeing if there's any questions that can be answered and that can be the evening. So I thought it would be useful. It is a hard medium to describe. And uh, as you heard from the audio, uh, I have the speakers already cranked up a bit and you might want to dial them back, but there's a video <laughs> teaser for the show that I worked on there. That was the next big piece. It's about 70 seconds in length. It might speak better than I could do it as far as tone and content. Uh, if you click right on the play icon in the middle of the screen, it should be able to activate. That was the kind of preview teaser for the show. They remain very kind of tight-lipped about the experience itself. But I wanted to show that because one thing that I find interesting and in its application to our schools and to my work with theater here is that um, their work has taken an increasingly expansive interest in what constitutes theatrical space, how one defines and creates that, how one thinks artistically about the experience of everyday life, one of my favorite verbs that they used was the verb relensing. How do you relens an experience so that you see it afresh or that you see it in a theatrical context or in a different kind? And leveraging an art form as expansive as theater um, to <clears throat> go out and think about not just a theater location, but the geography of theatrical work is something that we've already taken an interest in in the high school theater company and a lot of the work that we've done, whether it's installation work in downtown Amherst in an open store, whether it's using the school building as the theatrical environment. Um, this was right up our alley to begin with. And so the experience I had working with them on this show, which did uh, comprise pretty much a, a huge swath of downtown London, um, starting in the British Museum, which they partnered with, and then going out to other locations around town was incredibly insightful and exciting. Um, so that's the key kind of note there. Uh, the applications I'd be happy to go into at some other amount of detail, but for now I'll just leave you uh, with a quote. This is a review from The Guardian about it, and it's worth reading pretty quickly. 
As the experience unfolds, you have no idea which passerby might turn out to be involved. The cast is compact, somewhere between five and nine, and entirely female, and by my reckoning, which fits with the Aeschylus story, it was based on this Aeschylus play, of an island ruled by women who have murdered their husbands and fathers, this, the encounters last with the cast are mostly fleeting. And then it talks about Punch Drunk's expanding sense of theatrical space. Um, so I, I see a lot of interest in that, in getting our students to really think about theater not as a locked down um, depiction of what happens on a stage, but the possibility of what's all around you and relensing and reimagining the power and uh, quality of spaces. Um, those are just some process photos of some of the spaces we worked in uh, under work-like conditions, giant warehouse spaces. I was interested in that because so many times I think in the high school and work that we do around here, we're limited by what we have. You know, we're in school building a lot of the time or we're in one section of town. And so some of the most rich conversations I've had with student designers <coughs> is how to reimagine something or how to take something that looks very bland or neutral or austere and transform into something else. And I think if anything that's been really exciting for us, it has been that design process of students really reclaiming space, understanding it differently, relensing it, and using it. So I feel like I'm coming back with a wealth of tools, some of which are uh, aesthetic, some of which are technological, um, some of which are logistical, um, to create work like this in the future, which is very exciting. Um, the other half of the work is the educational arm, and I spent a lot of time, this is an actual location by the company that they use for their educational <coughs> offerings, and you should read that as roughly grades, uh, grades K through 12, um, with dedicated uh, enrichment teachers, which is their term for educational uh, workers, many of whom have teaching certifications or degrees or connections to schools, uh, and they partner with a large number of London schools to create work that brings students either into the environment of this show or, or this space, which is solely for kind of workshop-based work, or to bring work to a school and use this as a training ground. So students get a very rich mix of possibilities there and their partnerships with schools, which was very exciting to watch in process and see how they developed those partnerships and what worked and frankly what didn't, um, became a big part of my education too. And this was kind of the, the home ground for it. It is a actual town square built inside a giant warehouse is what you're looking at. Um, and this is another Guardian article on it. The name of the place is Fallow Cross. Clearly not from this century, but has been built as an act of faith in Punch Drunk's own future. Peter Higgin, who's the education director, uh, who has delivered some of the company's most thrilling work in schools and care homes, calls it a place where we can cook ideas, but also somewhere where we can call home. And as a place where I was witness to a lot of students getting to call a first encounter. Um, one project they did was a collaboration with Google and their technology to bring uh, uh, stories of the 12 labors of Hercules that started as a kind of a a kind of cheap looking video game in their schools that then came to life as the town itself that they came to visit with no prior knowledge. And they have pointed to studies, and this is, if anyone's interested, I can share this information, where they did post-literacy tests following their experiences where they had to commit to writing and literary analysis afterwards. And a number of students were jumping by grade level. Students that never spoke before were actively speaking and writing for the first time. Um, just the power of the arts to engage students at such a profound level beyond achieving certain skill bases, it, it was just astounding to watch. I feel like I was already sold and I'm biased on it, but <laughs> to see that with schools that I had no affiliation with and really no agency with was really, really exciting. Um, the last part of my uh, experience is there was a much broader thing that I just wanted to name. London is kind of uh, a hotbed for a lot of theater. It is uh, way better supported uh, at the federal level and at the municipal level uh, than a lot of American uh, arts are. And the payoff was really shown in the amount of work that they could attempt to produce or try out. So whether it's the bigger picture on the left, that's actually Brian Cranston staring back at me as I took that photo. In a traditional theatrical stage in one sense, it's in a theater, but my seat was actually in that, what is upstage right wing of the stage, that's the upstage wall. About 30 members of the audience could be on stage with this show in this other environment as it happened to a more mainstream audience out there. And it was just cool to think about that. When we recently um, put up the school musical, I actually took some of the things I learned from that show and employed it into that. Um, some of the other photos were just other immersive theater practices that were very exciting, including an American play that happened out on a rooftop uh, by the playwright Julia Jarko. That's the one at the bottom right. And another one that involved like 
a large amount of garden planting and scaling to create environment and space and just using everything available in a traditional area. So the sum is simple. I, I feel like there's just so many tools out there, a lot of inspirations. There is also, and I, I offer this deliberately as a sort of teaser, I, I've enjoyed keeping my ties with Punch Drunk. And one thing we're discussing uh, is how to bring one of their projects to the Amherst District. And one of the ways that might happen is their interest in getting further afield and trying to find ways to develop shows that don't require them standing over them. And given my relationship with them, which is now about eight, nine years old, um, we might get to be one of the first kind of test subjects for that. So perhaps in a six months or a year, I'll be able to come back and share news of, of that kind. Okay. I can leave the rest of the time for any questions uh, as you wish. Are there questions or comments either way? Very exciting. Thank you. I think so yeah. too. <laughs> but so for most of these productions, the, did the people know that there was a play going on, or, or was it did it sort of emerge in, from a crowd that had no idea what was going on? Um, for the ticket buyers, they definitely knew, okay. even though it was kind of veiled to them that that Greek production Cabaroy was. You bought a ticket, and the only thing you knew is that you would get this um, app from a fake tour guide company called Walking London, but it had your appointment time, and you punched it, was behind it, but it's very veiled. And I think that's a cool thing, again, thinking about student work, is that there's not always a lot of mystery in education, at least not intentional mystery. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, there is a lot of power in that, in awakening and building suspense and learning how to develop something in those ways. So there is a lot of pedagogical implications for that, too. Is it nice? Um, as you were talking, I was reminded of a, an experience that I had with my family recently, which was a, one of those escape the room kind of right. scenarios, right? Sure. Which felt very theatrical when we were going through it. And as a matter of fact, unfortunately, my youngest, who's six years old, um, burst into tears at one point because yes. he believed it so much. <laughs> he was so immersed in the experience, yeah. you know? Um, but it was wonderful, and it, it challenged my children, and, and all of us, actually, as we were going through that. And so I kept thinking about this experience also in students, you know, um, the, the excitement <coughs> that is palpable when you're creating something like this, and you have a say in how it's, it's staged, and you're thinking really outside the box or off the stage. Um, is just, you know, it's such a, a unique experience. So thank you so much for sharing that. I, I you know, just set my imagination ablaze too. Right. Well, I appreciate your comment because I, first of all, I agree, like seeing the amount of student agency in the design process or development process is nothing like taking a published play on a traditional staging, as wonderful as that also mm -hmm. is. Um, I, we've seen students come to life in ways that we haven't seen before through that work, so that's great. And I also add that, given your son's experience, there is also a, a important code about responsibility here and audience and performance engagement and it becomes an opportunity to talk about what is our responsibility as art makers and as future art makers with students and I, I welcome those conversations with students too. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I just want to comment that I, I feel like there's a real, I, I am sensing a real current in our community about how strong and creative and unique and um, unusual our arts and theater program are at the high school and, and uh, you know, there are a, a lot of options in the area and I just, I, it's really exciting for me to talk to other families and just say, you know, I just feel like the, the arts program at the high school and the theater program is unlike anything I've ever seen and I, I think this is just an incredible, and I know you've been doing this kind of work and it's been evolving, but this is just a, a wonderful new chapter. So thank you and I love the musical, as I said. <laughs> I <laughs> loved it. Well, it, it's an appropriate time to give a shout out both to this committee and Superintendent Morris and also to my, my building administrators su for supporting this. I mean, there's just any number of questions you wouldn't ask if it's just a traditional stage play. So their support has been instrumental to work like this too. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you very so much. much. Yeah. Thank Thanks for your patience too, by the way. Of course, no. We, we flipped an item, and at least I didn't anticipate that. I mean, <laughs> I should have anticipated that <laughs> it long, but I didn't. And if I had, we probably would have just waited and taken you in order. That's fine. We I was really genuinely fascinated by it. <laughs> <laughs> thank, right. thank you very much. Thank, so thank much. you. Uh, so the next is uh, No One Needs a Break or anything. I'm just going to walk them out, but I think Mr. Mangano will be the point person for the next one. Okay. I've been on the committee, but I mean, no one else. Okay, good. We're good. Got a bone to pick with the agenda setter to put me after that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I looked at the agenda, I was coming after marijuana, and then I switch it Our off. Our expectation, this by is the much way, more exciting. was he that, that uh, the warrant the review process <laughs> would become far more theatrical. <laughs> <laughs> This, so was all, this was all about the, the drama. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I pa I'm passing around warrants. So now's a good time if you want to take a minute and look at them in more detail. Certainly can. Um, just one, I think, in region. Uh, Peter, you don't 
There's nothing in Amherst. Okay. So. so last time we spoke, we talked about a few different options for having a warrant review to recap some of those options and Ms. Ordonez uh, jump in if I, I miss any. Uh, we talked about having sort of uh, open hours at the office, which was sort of all the time, but we could have designated hours in the business office for anybody to stop in and um, review the warrant in more detail, sit with me, go through it, that kind of thing. Um, we talked about having maybe a special committee set up that specifically <coughs> does that, either maybe during the day or before meetings, something like that. Um, we could do it at the beginning of meetings if you want to allocate time that way. Um, we could also, in a little bit, I could try posting them online so that maybe you can see them a little before the meeting so you have more time to review them that way. Um, and I could also, we could do something with Budget and Finance Subcommittee where maybe we meet more regularly to review the warrants. Even warrants that maybe have already been approved, we could kind of recap them. So those are the options I've sort of seen so far. Open to any of them, whatever you guys want to do. Um, no specific guidelines, I guess, or preference per se. I think I, I want to hear what co my colleagues have to say, but um, I think from, from my perspective and, and from the conversations I've had with you previously, um, <laughs> the online version might be less desirable only mm. because while on the one hand the pro is that um, it gives people the luxury of being able to review things, you know, in the privacy of their own home, on their computers, in their own time, at the same time, that may also mean that some people may end up putting that off or may just not happen in the same exact way as if you have a physical meeting or you're, you know, engaging. And so um, the more I've thought about it, the more it feels like maybe the online version isn't exactly, you know, right. where we, we should go. Um, just my perspective on that. And then just one other quick note, because I had shared with the superintendent and with our chair, Mr. Nakajima, the um, agenda. Uh, as a sample from the, I think it was the Beverly uh, District, um, and they have um, an agenda process also. So it's not just the warrant review process, but it's also the agenda process, and it's the agenda process to more, more or less formalize the, you know, the warrants that are being signed um, mm -hmm. and have the committee take a vote on sure. that. Yeah. And so I was just wondering if there had been any thought given to that or if you know, if you're willing to have that kind of a conversation mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe it's for a later date. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, again, I'm open to whatever the committee wants to do. Um, this is really a process to, to make you feel more comfortable um, signing the warrant. So uh, we'll, so we'll, we'll do whatever. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out how that would play out. Are we talking about, um, for example, <clears throat> this is the warrant for this week or mm -hmm. for this meeting? Yeah. It totals X amount of dollars. Um, this, some of the things that we're you're signing off on are payroll and standards. Yeah, stuff. I don't know exactly. if it's a detailed review of like each line item or or how it works. So, but. It so uh, just in response to that question, I think it, it, the the sample that I saw was even simpler than that. Mm -hmm. So it was basically you know um, general amounts. You know, let's say twenty five thousand going mm -hmm. to payroll. Um, you know, 50,000 or whatever going to X project, and it's broken down more or less by um, sort of budget area or, you know, however you, the, mm -hmm. the finance department sure. is coding that information, mm -hmm. um, and then the total amounts. And so it's just a sense of, you know, I think the, the idea is that in between the actual school committee meetings, there has been a degree of inspection and understanding from the people who are actually signing the warrants, but then the whole committee comes together to actually approve the final <coughs> line amounts or the, the final you know total amounts. And it's basically just saying, yes, some of us have reviewed this in more detail, completely understand this, and we're okay with these amounts getting pushed through. So interestingly enough, when I was having a conversation with somebody from the MAC a while ago, um, it wasn't actually on this topic, but then, but then the topic came up. And um, I know in that person's school district, and I know you'd reference this, but I'm, I'm interested in how many school districts do utilize subcommittees that review warrants. Because mm -hmm. it sounds like it might actually be a more common, at least somewhat common practice to have them. <laughs> and I think if we were, if we were concerned if, if, there, if there's a general sentiment on the committee that people are unsatisfied 
Not that there's anything wrong we think that you're doing on this process, Mr. McGonagall. That's it's right. not the point. But rather, between what you do and how the committee interacts with that information, reviews it, and feels confident that when the signatures are going on it or the approval is being made, that uh, whatever due diligence we're supposed to be doing as a committee, that's been applied in a way that uh, ensures some reasonable right. level of responsible oversight mm -hmm. that's reflected in our signatures, that apparently a lot of other school committees solve that natural gap by appointing a subcommittee and undoubtedly, I imagine, they probably rotate those members every year so that no one ever had, with all great love and to this process intended, that no one was actually forced to do that any longer than they had to <laughs> in order to be able to ensure that the committee was playing its responsible role. Um, and, and that, if we're concerned, if we're generally concerned, and I understand why the committee would be, if we're generally concerned that there's kind of a gap between what we're doing and what we know about it, that just seems like every other idea we have, if it's online, you know, but you, but then you still have to go in and talk to you about right. any questions we have, right? So that's not working. And I mean, it doesn't guarantee any greater knowledge of what the, the transactions are. And I, you know, if we put it on at the beginning of the meeting, then that would just eat up lots of meeting time where I'm not sure is either A, productive, or B, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it, it could be, that could be awkward as well. And so if we really want to do it, I think the idea, and then that would, that could dovetail with the idea of having something on the agenda that's approved too, right? Because mm -hmm. as you mentioned a moment ago, Mr. Dennis mentioned a moment ago, you'd have a subcommittee reviewing, and then it'd be put on the agenda to sort of formalize the process of adopting what the committee is delegated the responsibility of having gone through. Are there other thoughts on this? Um, I mean, my, my comment would be that um, generally based on the process um, that it takes to get to the warrant, I'm generally confident that those are correct charges and they were for valid things and we've received the goods or services. Um, from my oversight position on, the, on a budget, I'm generally concerned with how's it going, right? right? Like, I'm, I'm confident that we're, we're paying for things that we've, we've purchased, but how are we doing and, and do we need to make some changes or set direction? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, the nice option of if we do a subcommittee who's sort of doing the everyday signing, um, that we periodically have, you know, um, kind of like a financial report to the entire committee that kind of says, here's, here's, how it go here's how it's going and we're kind of on plan or we're behind or we're ahead or, um, and that we would just talk about that really high level discussion and it, we could maybe sure. keep that relatively short. Okay. Um, so I'm real glad that Mr. Jennings has, has brought this up because it was one of the first things that made me uncomfortable when I started was this is my signature. I mean, there's nothing more <laughs> evocative of your you know, and so I thought I would have a really strong opinion on this. I, I've thought about this a lot, and I have a very, very neutral. <laughs> <laughs> this because because of two things. One is, from what I understand, it's required by law, and so so it must be done. So it, it is a technical requirement. However, from everything that we've tried to learn and understand, there's absolutely no legal liability that a school committee member is really ever going to in in the you know, unforeseen crazy circumstance that there's something wrong, it's never going to come back to me. You know, and so I feel zero liability when I'm signing it. And, and I also feel I have no normal or expert level um, accounting ability to be able to, them. even if I had half an hour to review it, I would feel really no more informed than not looking at it at all. So for me, it's completely meaningless in terms of what it, it expresses, in terms of my approval <coughs> or not. But it's technically required. So at this point, I'm I'm happy to, to do whatever most people are comfortable with. <laughs> are there any So um, I think I just I, I'm uh, thank you thank you for everybody for your comments and your thoughts and I and I, I I get it and I you know to take Mr. Menino who's not here his point that he said and, and that you said the um, the possibility of us catching anything that is you know, in any way nefarious is pretty much zero. So if we're going to have a subcommittee, you know, take more volunteer time to do something, I, I would hope that it would, you know, and I, it would be not 
and I'm not I'm not implying this anyway, but it's sort of you know that thing of like well it appe for appearances that it looks as though we're we're um, you know doing due diligence, but what are we actually accomplishing in doing that? So you know and maybe we really are accomplishing <coughs> a sort of sense of comfort and a sense of you know we really know what we're signing, but I just want to just want to say that mm -hmm. a little bit out, out loud to sort of have that be um, you know that we're, at, we're that at, as we choose intentionally to use more member time and have more meetings, et cetera, more minutes, more everything, mm -hmm. um, just making sure that it really is accomplishing something that is going to accomplish something. Stomach pinch? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I would like to see um, the categorization, the, the different categories of, of what the, um, how we spend our money. So for example, I don't think we ever, you know, discuss, you know, um, well, this particular warrant, it's high because we just went through, a, you know, mm -hmm. lots of negotiations and the attorney had to, right. had to retain the attorney. And so this is what it is. And we are on, you know, budget for the rest of the calendar year or the academic year. Um, these are the fees because, you know, it's this high because of this big purchase of this equipment. You know, um, I think those types of highlights um, would be helpful, um, regularly updating us um, on how much we're spending on certain items so that way we can have um, a good understanding of, you know, where all this money is going. So can I maybe offer a suggestion? I like the subcommittee. My only concern with the subcommittee is the timing of it and would it slow down the warrant process. And a lot of what I'm hearing is, um, even if we do that, the warrant itself maybe isn't enough. So maybe we could try um, try out for a couple months maybe a little report to go with each warrant that tries to capture what I've heard, which is trying to categorize stuff a little bit and maybe highlight sort of important things in the warrant um, that's important for you to know. I mean, the, the budget piece we do with the quarterly reports, um, but maybe there's some way to incorporate that into a report. I'll have to think about it, um, but it seems like that's the common theme is more context to the warrant as opposed to just diving into the like the vendor um, piece of it. Is it in this? So um, with the chair's permission, I just mm -hmm. wanted to go through quickly. These were, I, I had requested that uh, Tracy Novick, who's the field coordinator mm -hmm. for MASC, Massachusetts Association of School Committees, send me the slides that she shares with other school committees during you know, the conference um, she was presenting last, last year. And so this is very, very, very short, so I'm just gonna read through this very quickly. Um, so uh, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 41, Section 56 says, a selectmen in all boards, committee, heads of departments and officers authorized to expend money shall approve and transmit to the town accountant as often as once each month all bills, drafts, orders, and payrolls chargeable to the respective appropriations of, the, of, of what they shall have the expenditure. Um, and then uh, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 41, Section 41 says, such approval shall be given only after an examination to determine that the charges are correct and that the goods, materials, or services charged for were ordered and that such goods and materials were delivered and that the services were actually rendered to or for the town as the case may be. So the key language there I think is um, such approval shall be given only after an examination mm -hmm. and that is really where we are right now, right? And so MASC recommends that school committee members should know and understand what they are signing. They should have a chance to review and ask questions about the warrants and they should be given enough information to know what is being approved for payment. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think our general process currently doesn't fill all those different buckets, right? Doesn't you know? And, and so there's a very detailed you know review of, of who the vendors are and then the amounts, but it doesn't have any information in there. So I think um, you know, Mr. Mangano, your suggestion of maybe having some sort of little report. I would say report is maybe even too much information. Like sure. even like bullet points. Like you know this you know this amount went through this cost uh, area and you know, this, this amount was spent towards this final thing that was yeah. approved on, you know, something along those lines would help us understand. And, and I think that's no problem for major, what I can't do, right? I, I mean, I could do, it's just, it's a resource thing is we, you know, we have six, 60 million roughly in, in a budget between the three districts. So I couldn't go through every single line item and sort of, do, but I could do that for the major, the, the big pieces um, that I think would be the most important to you. My thought, I was going to respond. Yeah, sure piggyback on that. I was going to say my thought on that would be 
um, calling out, uh, I hate to call them unusual expenditures, but things that are worth speci specifically calling out. Mm -hmm. um, and then my guess is, well, not my guess, I've looked through these things. There's a huge number of the different accounts, or, line, or expenditures rather, that would fall into a bracket of payroll and, I mean, you know, depending on what we're signing, yeah. payroll and, um, you know, equipment and supplies and food yeah. or whatever, in which, in which you could probably sort of summarize those different areas readily in those sort of master categories uh, and then call out other things that are more, you know, worth calling out. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that something, let me just ask the committee, is this something that you think, because I think, by the way, our next stop would be starting a subcommittee. And I understand Ms. Ha Ms. Hazard's um, comment. And also, given the amount, the extraordinary, on an evening in which I was talking earlier about how, how awful it is to lose school committee members after they've gained so much experience and wisdom and have been able to apply it, um, creating another subcommittee that also sounds like, um, forgive me for saying this because it's not kind, it sounds like a largely thankless task of like, you know, wading through spreadsheets and asking questions about them. Um, that sounds like another great opportunity for people to decide they want to quit school committee <laughs> or not, not run for re-election. Um, so this might be the next, the next last stop before we get to a school committee. Do you want to try that? Create a subcommittee? No. No, the presentations. Oh, sure. I'm seeing you're relative look, you're nodding. Looking for general consensus? Yeah, just sort oh, of. We don't need to vote, but we just need, you know. Little nods. Okay. Are you up for it? And my understanding is that it'll be like a cover sheet that goes on top. Would I present it at the beginning of every meeting, or would it just be for you to read as you well, go through I think and sign? We might have a little presentation. All right, just making sure. I mean, we're, you know. Sure. Is that right? Well, I, my only thought is just as we're thinking about su subcommittee and, you know, time of school committee, I also want to kind of try and balance what we're asking of the business yes. office as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yes. I just want to make sure that that feels doable and not, you know, unduly burdensome. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'll say is it ebbs and flows. So even, you know, the conversation tonight, there's some committee members that are super into looking at it. There's some that, you know, technicality I heard. Um, I think that's always been the case in the district. Yeah. It kind of ebbs and flows like that. Um, so even whatever process we have, I think the open door policy will continue to exist, which if you ever want to stop in, you can see all, you know, every warrant you have has a binder or a, a file folder like this that has all the invoices that you can go through. Um, and so those are always, we put them out so people can grab them. Um, so I think we should try it and, and then that, that also exists if anybody wants to come in. Mm. Anything else? Anything else in? Uh, I, I think it would be insightful, actually, to keep track of all of the things that we're spending money on. You know, you know, if it's utilities, mm -hmm. um, maintaining our buildings. You know, so sure. I think more informed um, school committee is is good, and I think um, checks and balances are always good, sure. and there will always be people who may be interested in serving in that particular subcommittee that would invest that type of time. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Good. Thank you. Is there anything else you have tonight, by the way? I think that's it. Happy to move Is that it? Up. <laughs> we can. Thank you. Because I appreciate your patience. Yeah. Um, school committee protocols. So, uh, if you want to log in, do okay. you want to do that so I can project it? <clears throat> yeah. If you send it to someone, I should be able to, I can get it. Okay, so you said it you said to Debbie? That's right, I did. So uh, if you go to your it's not on the screen, no one can see what you're doing. <laughs> okay. So um, there was an email sent that at an hour where we didn't we weren't able to print so what Miss Marriott's doing is she's pulling up the, the revised document that she worked on. because um, it it came to staff after staff had left for the day. Okay. But that's what, just to explain what mm -hmm. it's what the, so. Sorry, I don't know. No, no, that's fine. Is it the same as what's in our packet? Miss Mary told me that so was the, the old version. Was that no, it's the actually. The packet had an older version. I see, I see. And I didn't catch oh, it I see. until a late hour. But, the version got it in the last meeting. 
this was very close to. Okay, so just to kind of introduce introduce it um, again. So the as it comes up, you'll be able to see, but it's it, there's some highlighted elements that we have talked about in the past, and so um, some of them I added some adif additional clarifying language based on um, what MASC has when they in their kind of like general protocols document. Um, so that might be helpful for some of them. Um, for the first one that we had extensive um, discussion about last time about supporting the official position of the school committee, um, I would suggest that take a look at the clarifying language and if, if people still don't like this one, I would suggest we just delete it um, and, and because we have this was recommended by somebody else as well because this document is already quite, you know, comprehensive and we, I don't know that we need to just to spend additional time debating any particular elements if they're problematic for, for members. Um, I also added on the, um, under how we conduct meetings, there's one more kind of uh, specific, not, maybe we should just go one by one. Yeah. yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's do that. That's good. Is, everybody, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Is our goal, hopefully, to be able to approve these? I think that's a great goal. Um, <laughs> I don't know how the committee, you know, feels. But I think that I think that's doable for tonight. No, I, I, I agree with you. So I wouldn't even mind taking this serially so that as, we're done, as you introduce a topic, we take a little straw poll and we edit it on the fly. Okay, that sounds good. That's good. So the first one being, our, oh, once the school committee has taken action or made a decision, will not actively work against the official position of the school committee. This does not preclude principal disagreement or future attempts to change policy. It simply indicates that committee members will not undermine the work of the majority's policy of the district. Uh, and the comment was, this is an attempt to amend the language to reflect the debate we previously had on the topic. But on a suggestion on the floor is if people still have some objections to it, Let's just can the entire paragraph and not worry about it. Any thoughts? Can it. Okay. <laughs> we, okay. Can we work on a consensus model? I think if somebody feels strongly that it should go, then I'm, I'm okay with it. I... Okay. Uh, yeah, agreed. This, this should reflect what we're we have a consensus on. Therefore, if we don't have a consensus, bye bye. <laughs> that, that is an awesome. Something is having. That is an awesome nod of the head yes. to the consensus model. So let's just get rid of it then. Yeah, done. Okay. Next. Um, so the only comment I want to make about the second one, this it says we will direct all personnel complaints and criticisms received individually or collectively to the superintendent. This used to have some additional language about chain of command, and um, there was some concern. Well. We don't specify what the ch chain of command is, so I simplified it just to this. Mm -hmm. and I, I feel like that still does an, an important job and maybe is easier to stand behind. So, people okay with this? Yeah, yeah. We're good with it. Okay. Can we? Um, I don't know if you have access to the document. This is a PDF. Oh, it is. She's marking it. Up. Okay. Oh, you're marking it up. Okay, yeah. excellent. Never mind. Okay. I just want to make sure we were yeah, getting our check marks and our deletions while we're going. If we're hoping to approve this tonight. We'll do track changes. <laughs> okay, so I can read the next one. Um, the superintendent and the school committee recognize the importance of proactive communication and agree that there will be no significant surprises. If school committee members have questions or concerns, they agree to contact the superintendent well in advance of a meeting. This does not preclude a committee member from asking a question or raising a point that arises during the course of a discussion or debate that could not be anticipated. <coughs> so that additional language is just trying to kind of clarify, <laughs> you know, what constitutes a surprise and what's still, you know, it's still okay to bring things up on, on as discussion progresses and whatnot, so. People okay with this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay. In order to promote consistency of communication, only the school committee chair and or his or her designee shall have the authority to speak for the school committee to other public bodies in the media. Individual members may express their views and opinions to the media and community, but should state them as such. I believe this had some additional language um, that was that I that I struck because people had some concerns about it. So I, I just kind of cleaned up this idea. Okay. So I don't know if this works or we could also strike this one. If are it, people okay or should we strike this? I think this also is in very similar to the words that are in. We have a, I think a policy. Right? Ethics so policy. This is very. I think it's almost identical to the policy. We're good. Let's okay. move on. Final one uh, is about conducting meetings. And this is very similar to what we had before. We acknowledge that a school committee meeting is a business meeting of the school committee that is held in public, not a public form or hearing, unless designated as such. The public is encouraged to attend and to make use of the public comment period, but the committee will not engage in dialogue with the general public unless indicated on the agenda. So at last, unless indicated on the agenda phrase is a new addition, but otherwise it's similar. Okay. So um, the I'm I'm just concerned about the chair's um, discretion to be able to engage in communication, um, but it's not on the agenda. You know, like it's not an. Agenda. Oh, you mean in other words, the notion that the chair retains the discretion to uh, allow public comment or question if deemed warranted. Something like Correct. that. Correct. Like unless you know. I, mean, I think that is a rule we have. That actually, the literally, the chair is allowed to do that. Yep. Yeah, that's discretion of the chair. Yeah. I mean, in fact, if you might know this more than I would, but um, isn't that kind of part of Robert, Robert's rules of order that the chair, at the, the, their discretion, can suspend the rules for what they feel to be as appropriate? Or am I stretching the? That's a little stretch. I mean, you actually you still have, you have to cons get the consent of the body to okay. to just suspend the rules, but you can. Um, I think there are other rules that allow us to do that. No, I'm serious. Cause, I mean, actually, to be honest with you, Ms. Hazard has used this rule more than I have on the Amherst School Committee. But I, my recollection, that's not dumb about this, my recollection is you did so very appropriately. Mm. <laughs> so I have, yeah. I think that rule does exist. Yeah. I don't know where right, I so maybe it says it, unless indicated on the agenda or at the discretion of the chair. Well, could I add that phrase? That's sure. Or at the discretion of the chair. Or at the discretion, the discretion of, the of the chair. Okay. 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 Um, I, and or at the discretion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And or, <laughs> obviously. So, um, just. <laughs> <laughs> no, creative dreams. So, I guess I just, one, one thought. Um, I mean, this, the protocols is kind of an agreement we're making with each other about right. how we're going to conduct business and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and this is getting to be a lot of information mainly directed, I think, at the public. Mm -hmm. So, Maybe it's still appropriate to have in here. I mean, other school committees have had similar stuff in their protocols, which is why it landed here in the first place. But I'm, I'm just, it's getting rather long and specific, so I don't know if we still feel like this is necessary here. So I, my, my comment would be I, I kind of like it because if you're a new member, this is a great resource. Okay. And this is something I think that's important. It's exactly what I was going to say. And also the fact that then even saying something kind of funky at the end, like or at the discussion of the chair, hey, that means a new member when, you know, like, if, if, if you had done this at a chair with the new member and they're like, oh my God, I'm so happy. I just read this today in the protocols. It turns out this can be done, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to, hey, it wasn't indicated <coughs> on the agenda. What gives you the right to do that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of a... Oh, was it trying to... No, 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 I'm done. <laughs> um, so just the, the times I've seen this used in terms of the chair's discretion has always been with the consent of the committee. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not saying it okay. needs to be in there. That may have just been customary the way the chair chose to do it. Um, so I don't know Robert's rules well enough to know whether that needs to be in there or that's something that you all feel strongly. It's not my decision to make, but I just wanted to note that I've always seen it used with the chair saying something to be the meeting, like it's not on the agenda, I feel like because of the topic, and looking around the table to make sure that there was consensus on the committee. Well, from a Robert's rules, I mean, it's funny because that's actually the question of where, where that power came from, right. because it goes back to what Mr. Demley said, I'm really positive that if you're actually using Robert's Rules of Order to suspend the rules, you absolutely have to have consent of the body to do so. Yeah. But there's also, this is why I didn't know where it came from, because, <laughs> because I also know that because we're not, we're not bound by Robert's Rules in the sense that we're not allowed to create customary rules of, of, right. of facilitation um, 
you know, meeting facilitation that are extra to Robert's rules of order. So do we need to keep debating this? No. Yes. I, I mean, with consult from the rest of the committee or, or with input? From I, mean, I, I mean, if we, if we, I mean, also, I mean, not to sound, uh, this is awful, but I mean, if the rules are suspended, the reality is a member of the body can actually petition the chair to suspend the rules to do something. You don't actually have the chair just do that. Um, so, um, I don't know what the well, I didn't mean to complicate matters. Well, the, I apologize. The chair, the chair <laughs> recognizes who speaks. So, yes. um, effectively, if you're going to allow, uh, you know, yeah, if you wield a heavy gavel as opposed to a light <laughs> gavel, which is what I prefer to do, Mr. Dowling. I, I think an interesting example recently in this yeah. was during our um, vocational school discussion where the superintendent spoke out of order. Yes. You almost gaveled him, but you didn't. That's true. And so there was this informal consent of the chair. I think we were all okay with you making that call. Yes. But it's not like you stopped and said, everybody okay, everybody okay, and then it was like in the moment kind of yes. a thing. That's, I think that's maybe what we're trying to get to without yeah. trying so to didn't constrain you, didn't the Didn't we write something capacity. down originally, Emily? Ms. Marriott? Like at the end of, unless indicated on the agenda, there was a comma and then a little phrase we were going to include? And or at the discretion of the chair. Okay, hold on a second. Are we okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Let's move on. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody has a problem with that. Let's just move on. And leave it. Leave yeah, it yeah, there. Okay. Leave, leave, there it is. All right. So. Um, at the discretion of the chair. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> that that we'll is like all the highlighted time. sections <laughs> that we had discussion around last time. Yes. So. Unless people have anything else. Okay. So. <laughs> We're done. I'll make a motion. Please do. <laughs> to approve the protocol as amended. Second. Is there a, there's a move and second. Is there further discussion? Other than to thank Ms. Marriott. Thank you. No, not other than to thank Ms. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I said that wrong. I meant to invite thanking her. Please do. Thank you very much, <laughs> for, for doing what was a difficult. And I really love the very last line, which is um, makes this all this work. It means it won't disappear. You know, that annual you know, review by the policy subcommittee. So as soon as the sub policy subcommittee reconvenes every year with new members, they'll be like, oh, we need to look at this. It'll be great. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So now we need to vote, of course. So the, the applause happened before the vote. Um, all those in favor of approving them, please raise your hand. They carry unanimously. <laughs> you realize, by the way, in uh, another, is it six weeks or something like that? Miss Marriott may be departing us, or will be departing us. Oh. School what? So, so there's, there's, there's just Ross a reflective time <laughs> forward at the awesome work of this committee. I move that Miss Marriott does not depart us. <laughs> uh, I already tried that. Apparently, uh, she has a, a higher power she responds <laughs> <laughs> at home. Uh, okay. Superintendent evaluation process. Yeah. Do you want to take the lead on this? Sure. So um, what you will see in your packet is a cool looking graphic created by Ms. Marriott um, that may not be totally clear at first. <laughs> and then after it, um, I just included the minutes of our last uh, subcommittee meeting because I think that it really outlines mm -hmm. what the um, tasks that were put forth to the subcommittee were. And I just want to note that the last thing in this is that um, these proposals will be brought before the committee, not at the 7th because we didn't get there, um, but this meeting. However, the subcommittee agreed that apart from this year's scenario, it doesn't make sense to discuss the options until we know whether or not the charter passes. So we're, we're putting out a bunch of options. I don't think it is, we, we felt as a group that it wasn't logical to take a lot of time to you know, deliberate over these, given that we don't know what's going to happen in a week, okay. and it might change everything. But um, I just want to sort of quickly review sort of what, what we put together so people can have a little time to peruse these in the coming uh, weeks, um, see, and, and just see how it, how this, we were, we were trying to think of, like, would there be a way to create a calendar graphic that would kind of help, help you reference? Mm -hmm. Because it, it's a, it's a lot of, um, 
it's a lot of factors. It's a lot of factors to sort of integrate uh, in order to determine what could be possible. Um, and then also, so what's listed here is a, a number of options. I think there are five different options that we came up with um, based on all the different uh, elections and town meetings. Um, and then we also created a recommendation for this year. Um, and for each of the options, we listed sort of the positives and negatives that we saw for each one, and then some general recommendations and sort of thoughts that we had as we went along. Um, and I will say that we really felt that none of the options were stood out as great. They all have some mm. serious sort of, huh, that's not great about them. <laughs> so that's, wow. you know, we really tossed it around quite a bit. So that's where we landed. So I just, I guess I'll look to our committee and to the chair in terms of, from here, do we want to talk about those options? Do we want to jump right to the one for this year? Because that's the one that really we need to um, make some decisions I think it'd on. be great to talk about the one for this year first. Yeah. And then pending. I know we're, and by the way, people may have all the time in the world this evening, so I'm not trying to push the agenda schedule. But we're, we're running way behind. So I want to yeah. give people, once we've cleared that, give, give the committee the deference to ask whether they want to continue on. I think that makes a lot of sense. So uh, if you look at the last page of this section of the packet, it says recommendation for this year. Um, and as we talked about this, really what we were trying to communicate was um, that we wanted to allow um, the opening for all members to, for members to have the choice. And we also didn't want new members to feel, they want, we wanted to make it really clear that they should not feel compelled to complete the evaluation or if they did not feel comfortable doing so, however, they had the option if they did feel comfortable doing so. So I'm just going to read it. Recommendation for this year. For this year, all current members are eligible to participate in the superintendent evaluation. We want to make it clear to the new members that they are not obligated to complete the evaluation. School committee members can only evaluate based on what they have experienced during their tenure as committee members, as a committee member, which includes artifacts presented by the superintendent. Therefore, what members may have observed or experienced prior to coming on the board cannot be part of the evaluation. Given this, new members may not feel they have sufficient knowledge or context to complete the evaluation. However, if they feel that they are adequately informed, they may choose to do so. New members should be aware that it has not been unusual for new mem board members to abstain from the process. All committee members will have the opportunity to comment and vote on the composite evaluation in public. And then we put a proposed timeline. Um, oh, and I wrote check contract because we didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure that that can happen. <laughs> um, and yeah. this looks similar to what we did last year. Right? It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. essentially what we did last year because it seemed like that worked, and but it seemed like it made sense to put it into writing so it didn't come to an awkward moment and it just would be a cleaner process. That makes sense. Is there, are there questions or comments about this? Any, starting with the subcommittee. Um, the calendar is very challenging. And in all cases, I think there was some consensus on our subcommittee that we would like to have the opportunity for members to have been on the board for a sufficient amount of time. And it wasn't clear what that is, but more than, more than a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, and to do that with all of our various town meeting schedules, and then you can throw the charter mix in there too, it becomes very challenging. It is very likely that there will always be some members who will not feel adequately involved to be able to fill out the superintendent evaluation. Other comments? Shemel? Um, I just want to commend the subcommittee. This is, might be one of the best subcommittee structured documents I've seen because <laughs> it's exactly what a subcommittee should do. You, you, you've met, you've worked together, this, you've discussed a lot, and then you presented options with positives and negatives. That's like so perfect <laughs> in terms of surfacing the greater committee, so thank you for that. Um, it, is it correct that it's against the, we've got legal uh, recommendation that school committee members can only evaluate based on what they've experienced during their committee? Like, that's not an opinion, yes. that's a... That, that came from, no, that, that came from the lawyer. I mean, yeah, yeah, the yeah lawyer. That's, what, that's what I meant. Yeah. I can, 
I can make sure that you have all the language that I got from the lawyer mm -hmm. before I am no longer with you. We I'm, <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> I just have been thinking, like staying up at night, like thinking about what everything I needed to I think that would be a very, I think that'd be a very good thing. Yeah. I actually rec I recollect <laughs> the email you got from Mark Terry because you actually did send it to me, good. and it does confirm but what both of you were just right. saying. That, it, that, that the new members are only supposed to evaluate based on their term of service as a school committee member and based on the artifacts or experience that they have as a school committee member. It also should confirm that when, when you were reading a moment ago all current members, it means current at the time of the evaluation. So for example, any current member who's no longer a member at that time is not allowed to participate. But we, were, we, were, we talked about that earlier, yeah. so we were clear on that. So Dennis? Um, Thank you to the committee also for, for putting this together. Um, I just wanted to comment. I mean, I, I think the recommendation for this year makes absolute sense. Um, and given the numerous challenges that we've had, both with you know signing the contract and going through and the big changes that are happening with, it, with the, the charter, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to follow this again. Um, I just wanted to comment on the general recommendations that you made. Um, the the lame duck session. I really like that idea. I mean, I think it's a great idea to incorporate just um, and maybe the members are on their way out won't like that so much. <laughs> but I think it's a great idea to incorporate just some time for people to have you know input into this incredibly important process and to bring that wisdom that we've been talking about that you carry through with you know with your as you serve on on the committees. Um, this would be a brilliant way to handle that. So. I, I'm in favor of that. <laughs> Just to comment on that is that we it, the charter. I mean, as it says here, the charter right. has a lame duck session. Has this lame duck session. So we were we. It came up in the me meeting. If that's a possibility, why wouldn't it be a possibility? And it would be something that all the towns would have to talk about, all that kind of thing. But so we have done no further exploration. But that's why it's in <laughs> that list. What's, inter yeah, what's interesting about this, and I'll get to this in a second. I just wanted to throw in a comment. Is um, uh, it seems like under any scenario you might imagine, though, doing the goals earlier, even as early as June, would be advisable, right? Because mm -hmm. it gives you more runway for any member of the, under any scenario, it gives them more runway to be able to um, uh, look at the performance and the evidence and the whatever it is for, in the context of what the goals that have been set. Mr. Um Yeah, I concur with Mr. Ardonia's that the recommendation for this year is, is really excellent, really well um, like clearly stated in terms of the reasons and so <laughs> nice, <laughs> nicely written paragraph um, and yeah that, that's a really interesting point about the lame duck for the small towns um, it's it, it would seem to be more empowering for the smaller towns you would want your most informed member to, to be the one speaking on the evaluation that's something right so that's great um, and yeah I, I love that you have the goals voted in June that's getting that done as soon as possible at the beginning of the superintendent's year in which he's actually working on the goals, this makes total sense. So thank you for that. Mr. Deming, by the way, I'd add something that I don't know. I, I, I think you have noticed this, but I'd point out this has actually been one of the most spectacular subcommittees for the entire last year. <laughs> Every single thing they've done, they brought wisdom, they brought precision, they brought, they brought a consensus model that brought in different ideas. And in fact, I recall, I recall distinctly what, eight or nine months ago, whenever it was, when we were done with last round of, uh, of the evaluation, and the question was raised, should the subcommittee continue and will the committee? And I was like, dear goodness, yes! <laughs> of course they will. Uh, and we're seeing the fruits of that work now. That's entirely true. We'll be running a class called Subcommittees One. <laughs> 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 that's, that's my next day. <laughs> Good. We'll look yeah, for right. it. Uh, okay, I think we're uh, I think we're fine for this right now. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And ah, this is actually, I'm sorry. Just before we transition, I agree with everything that was said, and perhaps the next meeting, um, the remaining members of that subcommittee. Um, I mean, I think the dates this year looks fine. I have no negative comments, but putting a finer point on some, when some of those dates, like May is a big month, right, 31 days, and, and just looking at our meeting schedule and then backwards designing it and whether that committee wants to leave that for me in the chair to do or they want to take a crack at it. Like, I don't have a sense of that, but I think the next step would be getting more concrete so with dates. I think dates that needs to happen 
period. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, it really needs to happen. Right. I'm with you. That's so, right. yeah. um, so I think I, we, you and I have talked about wanting to map out basically the rest of the fiscal year. Right. And because, and because also knowing that things come up. Yeah. And where does everything fit and everything? Um, I think it's a really easy answer. Okay. It's when the Pelham has reconfigured and the last new member comes to the first meeting of the region. So the, the real question is working backward from that. <laughs> right. uh, does the subcommittee want to take a crack at meeting with the superintendent on this subject, or do you want me to do it? Okay. That's awesome. Then you are, you are hereby <laughs> charged with taking care of that task. Great. Easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Me and Steve. <laughs> <laughs> They're all over it. Great. Thank you. And I, I didn't mean to belabor it, but I just think putting, getting the real dates and calendar. Mm -hmm. You still got that sort of recording, minute taking sort of mindset. You're like, I don't know how to record the follow up item. I don't want to know how to. It's a good thing. Uh, new member orientation, item six. <coughs> yeah. So, um, first I want to. Apologize for the late arrival of this in your inbox, and I apologize for any difficulties you had viewing it. Did people view it? Were they able to see it? Yeah. Okay. So this was, you know, working with Google View and through W, and we were trying to figure it out. So I'm sorry for any technical difficulties. Also, I did um, continue to work on this um, some. So in the current draft, I'll just hold it up so you can see what I've done is I highlighted in yellow throughout sections that um, were basically, I, you know, I had so much steam, this is as far as I got, mm -hmm. and those were the parts that I did not, you mm -hmm. know, were like, the, the placeholders were put in, um, Audra had created this outline, and I basically, you know, I added stuff that was basically some feedback, and then I went through and I tried to flesh things out in terms of providing links, providing general overviews, you know, pulling things from MASC, pulling documents that um, we'd gotten from Dorothy Presser, things like that. So, um, I think, again, this isn't, this, I, I didn't expect that this would look like sort of hashing this through in detail because that's not where it's mm -hmm. at, but my hope and dream is that I have laid a little <laughs> groundwork that people are so excited to continue and finish that this will turn into something that is actually useful to new members um, coming on. So, my suggestion mm -hmm. would be that a couple of people, or a, I don't know if you want to call it a subcommittee, I don't know, a, a, some sort of little small group was, um, would take this on and continue from here. Okay. Are there any, any questions before the grand question comes up and who wants to volunteer to help to do that? <laughs> um, but are, are there any questions? I mean, obviously it's a work in progress. Some people read it, some people didn't. Any comments or anything? Is there this? Um, so, uh, Great piece. Thank you very much. Um, the section meet with the finance director, um, and then there's a section of uh, sort of outline the budget process. I'm wondering if we could somehow blend those, or at least maybe repeat them, um, because I found I sort of had to, when I first came onto the committee, sort of feel my way around a lot of this stuff, and that was uh, one of the topics that I sat down to talk to Mr. Mangana about was, you know, how, do, how does this budget work? <laughs> what do you do with this budget? Um, and so I think just saying that outright and being super clear with new members that you know, the, the reason to meet with the finance director is to go over the budget process in, in detail and ask all your questions and kind of get all that stuff out in the open um, and can be really, really helpful. And I know that you linked to the orientation presentation, which mentions that a little bit, but still, um, you know, maybe incorporating the actual budget process into that, that piece might be really helpful. Does it, under C, does it currently say, under what number is this? Um, uh, D, 1D. That was 1D. One 1D, one and then 2C, um, oversee the budget. Mm -hmm. Do you have a link to finance director's graphic of budget process? Not yet. Okay, so that was added oh. <laughs> recently. Oh. So there is, okay. I did put in a graphic, but I, I mean, so I will say just as a more sort of meta comment, this is just a draft, so so if people, like, that, I think that's a great idea, and this is just me sort of figuring out how to massage things, and I, I'm not, I'm not, um, I think there's a lot of ways that this could be more compacted and stuff like that, and so my, again, my hope and dream is that people will take that on as something 
you know, like I don't think I'm going to necessarily work on this anymore because I'm not going to be coming to another. Re I mean, I can, but. <laughs> Oof, that's the door that opened. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know what to do with that. Kind of I don't know. I'm not, I think we sure take it and run with it. <laughs> <laughs> Right through that door. I, I welcome others to step to that door. Mr. Cage. Mr. Cage. I think Phoebe and I, I, mean, I think if you can recall, we were at the same orientation um, <coughs> by, uh, put together by a former chair of the Emmer School Committee. Um, and I don't think we have had one from the regional chair, per se, to do such an orientation. Um, but certainly the material contained here um, is extremely um, substantial and informative. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. So as a creative possibility to try and minimize the amount of um, administrative upkeep of this document and mm -hmm. also maximize its practical utility, I'm trying to think of the, so we're about to get new members coming on from <laughs> multiple towns, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the purpose is for this to be valuable to them. So I'm looking at item 1I, the new member mentoring. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe instead of trying to like perfect this or like throw as much steam as possible into making it this amazing like resource, you know, we, we do what we can. And then when new members come on, we're like, all right, here it is. It's draft. We did the best we could. There's a lot here. Why don't, you know, new members go through it. And then um, we could sort of combine that with if we, have, if we have volunteer current members who are willing to, say, meet with new members, like, I think the easiest would be, like, 6 o'clock before the 6.30 regional meeting, show up at the library, and what, and we could ask the new member, what's the, what's the, what are the things you want to talk about? Like, because th there might be individual interests in, oh, my gosh, I need to talk about open meeting law, or, oh, my gosh, I need to talk about the budget. Um, and then we can sort of go through there and use that as the facilitating for the, the mentoring. And then as, as they sort of go on board, at the end they can say, oh, well this was helpful about the document and this was totally not. And they take responsibility for evolving it from there. I would, I would just hate to throw lots of good um, attention and effort into making this perfect and then having it just become static. Well, the funny thing about it is, is that the most important thing about the document and the information it contains is whether or not it actually helps anyone get oriented. <laughs> Right? So it's the interface of this information with how we think new members are going to be able to interact with them, but also with I McGit, mean, yeah, rather, but also with us. I mean, any, 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 and by us, I mean the broader team, yeah. anyone from your team, um, superintendent. And uh, I guess the, question, the other question that comes up is do we anticipate, for example, that when's our next meeting of the Tenth regional? Of April. What? 10th of, 10th 10th of April. April. Yeah. Do we anticipate on the 10th of April when I think we would have two new members but not any other new members to engage immediately with orientation with those two new members and then approximately four to five weeks later when we have potentially other new members that will then engage like sort of serially when someone comes on we'll try to help them out. Mm -hmm. If we do that then that would sort of argue for a more I think as you're describing it a discursive process where we're sitting down, helping to do some immediate orientation, get questions, answer questions, show the document and other things we have. And then I think you're right, try to help mentor someone or help support someone get oriented. And then adapt, right? Meaning learn and adapt. The creatures crawling on shore. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going with that metaphor until someone stops me. Please. Oh, sorry. No, no, please. I, so I just, I'm just looking through here. I mean, I think that there are a few things in here that I just didn't get to that maybe Debbie could help me okay. just get linked in there and then that would be there. I mean, I, I also feel that, you know, this is a living document. To have, have it be virtual is actually fabulous because there's so many ways that it can change so easily. Right. Um, and I think of myself as a new member three years ago, and I think just to have something like this, where you, even if it doesn't have all the information, it tells you what you should be asking about. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't even really know, you know, what town meeting was and what the role of school committee was until it came upon me. And so just be like, oh, you know, what is this? And I, th I think even if it's not finished, it should be shared. I mean, you know, not my decision, but some version of it should be shared. In, and I think that alone would be helpful, even if it's not I think I think if two things. One, if, you, if you're willing to do this, yeah. Willing to follow up with Debbie to sure. get links in there. I think yeah. that'd be awesome. And two, I thought the consensus I was seeing emerge from the committee was that we absolutely thought this was worth sharing. And we were really more discussing how we were going to share it more than whether. 
Oh, no, I wasn't arguing No, I don't, I don't that. mean I just, that in a funny way. Like you're, It just came to me that, yeah, I, just mean, I agree with Peter. That doesn't even, that I, it's helpful. <laughs> okay. So but I, but I think we're going to. Don't get looked perfect in the way I finished. Get the way okay. Um, so you're going to... Yes, I'm sorry, Dr. Morris. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is just something I did based on a uh, conversation with other superintendents in Massachusetts in the Amherst election this year, just full disclosure, is I reached out to all three just saying, if you're interested in meeting with me just to hear my thoughts, answer my, you know, I can answer some questions you might have. And I had a disclaimer at the bottom, this identical email was sent to all three candidates who are running for office. Um, and I think in the in the other towns, if there is if there are competitive races, people know about. Um, I think just <laughs> I was that wasn't intended to be <laughs> a joke. <laughs> We're usually begging people to stand yeah. up at them. I have no idea where this conversation's going. <laughs> just keep rolling. I, I wasn't intended. <laughs> oh, you cracked up the superintendent. <laughs> But um, to keep doors open and keep yeah. them open neutrally, um, and, and, and it's something that, you know, I felt like the candidates, all three candidates in Amherst came in to meet with me. Um, I think the conversations were generative. I think this document, it, those weren't orientation conversations because they're not current members, but having something like this to walk through uh, it would be incredibly helpful based on my experience uh, talking with, with three enthusiastic candidates. And um, I think also just trying to set up um, some of this is like the nuts and bolts, but also the kind of dynamics and people have spoken about it where, no, when someone starts, they have access and they feel like they have access mm -hmm. to meet with superintendent, meet with finance director, meet with committee members. So I think as important as the steps are, there's also the kind of mood that it evokes that actually these are the things that we are here to help you with. Some of it's administrative, some of it's your fellow committee members. Uh, and I think that's really important. And uh, I don't want that to get lost in, in how much good content there is. I think the, the ethos of it is equally as important. So I think I think one of the things I'll also say, please, um, and uh, I would hope any chair would be willing to do this, um, to the extent that it's helpful, I'm certainly happy to actively participate in meeting with um, new members, um, with others, only for the purposes of there's just a lot of stuff we do in these meetings, and I know when you start. Um, actually, just I'll say this awkwardly, which I love doing publicly, that since I started a meeting, which I became chair almost immediately, um, it was really weird because I knew how to chair meetings really well. So like they literally, look, I'll call on you, and hey, you can talk next. <laughs> like that side was like super easy for me, but the, all the sort of norms of behavior and processes is like, you know, I felt like, you know, kind of a you know, a trained donkey, like, you know, like, what are we doing next? Oh, that's cool. We do this then? Oh, that's interesting. You know, and so I had sort of a weird sort of on-the-fly experience of doing that. But I'm just saying for any other new member, there's just stuff about getting acculturated to the meetings that, you know, I think, I think the idea of a combination of, um, you know, various officers of the, of the committee, chairs and vice chairs, helping to do that, as well as also mentoring from school committee members who are willing to take on that task, would be really, really welcome, in addition to the document and along with the meetings with the, and it's not, it may sound funny, but because people come on for different reasons or in different perspectives, I also wanna make sure that if somebody comes on and, and this, I'm saying <coughs> plain devil's advocate, they, they, they don't know the school administration, but they think the role of the committee is to set policy and sometimes that means what you're doing is wonderful and they agree. And other times, I'm gonna ask the hard questions, right? And that's that's the job of people who are, feel elected and often people feel that way, is I would wanna make sure also that there's felt like many doors open to get answers on, well, how does this really work? So that if somebody doesn't wanna to go to you to ask a question about how do I ask you a tough question, um, they can ask someone else that question of how to, and also what the norms are. Like what's, how are these things actually normally handled? Because somebody may have a tough question but they're not actually trying to be provocative or challenging. They're literally just trying to get a question answered, and they don't know how to do that. And we can help them figure that out. Mm -hmm. Quick Please. comment, one more. Just that um, in looking at a lot of the policies, again, as I created this, there is a new member orientation policy, um, which... <laughs> Does it work? Uh, <laughs> well, it describes a, a process of orientation that and I myself as a chair do not follow as well as I should have. So I, I um, brought that, or I brought that up with the policy subcommittee, mm -hmm. and the policy subcommittee, I believe, is going to just, because the question is, is this policy not happening to the T because it's not what 
should be happening or because the, it's not being followed and it should be followed? You know, does it need to be revised or does it just need to be instituted? So I just want to um, let you know that that's a coming attraction as well that I think will dovetail nicely awesome. with this process. Well, you know, one quick thought is, so this document is all about the new committee member, but what about the new chair? Mm. Right, because I think mm. oftentimes, you know, a chair assumes a position um, within the committee and they may be familiar with, you know, the various meetings and how, you know, things tend to go and, you know, whatever, but they're not necessarily familiar with how to chair a meeting, right? And so there's a whole, you know, and so that policy, the the lack of perhaps follow through on that particular policy is a great example of, you know, if a chair hasn't been brought up to speed on what their roles and responsibilities are, they may not even be aware that this exists, right? To, you know, so mm -hmm. it's something to consider for the future for all of us, I think, is how do we incorporate maybe a subsection on becoming chair of the committee yeah. and how is that That's different from being a committee member? Yep. That's interesting. Ms. Merritt. Um, I see a question in here, Pelham. Does Pelham want to be included in this document? <laughs> and I, I'm guessing that Pelham would love to um, take advantage <laughs> of this resource. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if it would be okay if we have actually a couple fairly new members. Would it be alright if I shared this with them? First of all, I think it would be helpful to them, but then also they can give us their feedback. And I would, I could kind of liaise. In the short term. I'm good. I'm good. Can you just use the newest good. version? Yeah. Yeah. It, which is always evolving. <laughs> By the minute. Which basically <laughs> means never. Right? It's always going to be, it's going to be new and always ever evolving. No, that sounds great. Okay. Um, just one administrative yes. thing. If you want to keep this as an electronic living document, that the, the committee can continue to edit over time, is there a location that it can be stored on Google Drive that all members would have access to view? I was actually thinking of this in the prior conversation, uh, prior two conversations about protocols and superintendent evaluation process. Um, so I just, what it made me think of is a lot of great work's happening and with transitions at times, things, documents that people put a lot of time and energy and everyone endorses. Sort of like, where's that, you know? So it, it actually made me think about, is there some level of Google folder repository um, that's mm -hmm. not tied to an individual committee member? Because mm -hmm. the way Google, like, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Ms. Hazard and Ms. Uh, Duomini Cage will lovingly lose their ARPS accounts, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Uh, I'm sure about the lovingly part. Um, <laughs> um, in a couple days or, or a week or two, whenever we catch up on the system. And so I think the challenge is, from a document perspective, having it based on individual members who change is problematic. So I'm, trying to think through with Debbie, maybe that's something we can work on about how to kind of facilitate that. Do we actually make a permanent like school committee email address so there's like a clearinghouse that every new member gets access to, um, but it's not tied to an individual member. With Google, it's like really important where things originate and where they're, you know, just from a, a document access um, perspective. So I just, I, I want to think through that a little with our IS folks, but I think just having a repository of the work of the committee is really important. And, and that we have a superintendent evaluation subcommittee folder that I think is probably attached to I yours. Probably. That we I mean, I have a lot of use. stuff like that. So, so that should be solved soon, if yeah. possible. Yes. Or at least before you delete her account. For <laughs> <laughs> clarity, I will not be deleting her account. <laughs> That's, oh, yeah. that's even worse, though, because that means it could happen before we know it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't mean tomorrow, but it is, no, you know. it is funny. I think at 1 o'clock in the morning last night, I said to my husband, I can move my whole Google Drive from my ARPS account somewhere else, right, so that I don't lose it. So I actually, it is on my mind. Yeah, no, it's a big yeah. deal. So I will work on resolving this this week. The other, the other okay. thing, though, Superintendent, is that I think that um, as, you're, as you're doing that, to the extent that audiences beyond the school committee don't have access, right. What I would hope we would be doing is um, ensuring that there's some sort of repository or access to this information that's genuinely public. Yeah. Because I because if if the if the document itself is edited and then brought back to the committee, then there'll be a point of of transparency and public engagement around the new version. I if you know what I'm saying, Absolutely. I'm not uncomfortable with the idea that we have a folder someplace that's beyond public reach yeah. <laughs> where we keep something that we can commonly work on. That sounds like a really Bad and dangerous like thing. Yes. It does sound it like does. an OM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just want to make sure that, as opposed to, yeah, yeah. 
having a place where we can put something where if somebody said, where do we find this thing to work on an update? Right. It, it is, you know what I mean? It is yeah. someplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like, yeah. Just calling that out. Yeah. Okay. What a productive meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have any gifts, by the way? I don't see any. I don't either. That's why this is, this is the moment of the evening I always ask that because what that means is, as everyone knows, we're up to our last item, right? It's got to be our last item of business if I'm asking whether we have any. Uh, Dr. Morris. Sure. On that last topic, just the last final note is we are going to be having a new website. Um, we took all that feedback that we had. We looked at our current vendor what was possible, and we've determined that we need to actually redesign the full site. Um, so we've been working with a, a different vendor on that. Uh, our plan right now is to have a soft launch on June 1st, which, um, so soft launch means not everything's on there, but enough's on there where people can see it, offer feedback, and a hard launch on July 1st, so that the community has access to comment before things become incredibly live and, and more static. Uh, I think the reason I find that related is we've looked at the school committee page, um, we looked at the policies, for instance, which the good news is they're searchable right now, the bad news is they're a little clunky in, in how people view it, so we've had trouble rectifying, like resolving those two dynamics, and I think the new website will offer us different possibilities on that front, uh, both the general, but particular to the school committee page, so that's what I was relating the access point that you raised. Right. <coughs> Oh, sorry, Mr. Oh, sorry. Um, just to follow up on that. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Rolls into the communication speech, bigger things. Um, uh, we had talked a little bit about maybe having a really easy, very prominent section for current initiatives. The, the, just because people are going to be thinking yeah. about, you know, this is both at the Amherst level and at the regional level about different, you know, big time projects. I don't know if, you, if that's part of the thinking. It is. Our current structure doesn't really allow for that to work well, to be blunt and time limited about my comments. Um, Th there's no way to do that, and the, the new infrastructure allows for board to be like right in the news updates. Like, there was multiple articles related to some districts I work for in today's Gazette, and allows for more of that, as well as kind of more defined pages that expanded to other pages. So, the, uh, the structure of it allows for much more engagement in the way that you describe. So, um, I'm going to move us on since, mm -hmm. since the website and communication actually aren't on the agenda tonight. Absolutely. Um, vocational schools update. So last Thursday, I had, a, I think, a very healthy meeting with uh, Superintendent Martin of Franklin Tech. We talked about communication um, between our two school districts. And we also talked um, about the gap that we that was discussed in our <coughs> meeting last Monday night that um, our district was facing in the approved budget. And so we resolved to try to fill that gap, understanding the current situation and structure and wanting to rebuild some relationships uh, between Franklin Tech and the district. Uh, I think it's no surprise to anyone that, that was, there were some challenges in that meeting. Um, that I'm not going to recount. So what we agreed to is that, um, and legal counsel approved this on both sides, that uh, what Franklin Tech is willing to do for us for the next academic year only is to set, uh, to waive the, this additional increment for students who attend Voc Tech schools who have special education needs. Uh, it's state defined at $3,600, and so that would be waived for the next academic year. Um, and so that would net us between twenty-five dollars and $28,000 to fill that gap. Um, I think this is a very responsive, um, I appreciate the responsiveness of Superintendent Martin to understand uh, our fiscal situation and to be responsive in a way that I think resolves some element of our challenge. I don't want to minimize the $1.1 $1 .1 million that we were involved in cutting, but the, the, the gap that we talked about at the last Monday night's meeting, um, this does not require a school committee vote, but I just wanted to share it with you, and if there were any questions or concerns, um, I, I'm happy to take them. Any questions or concerns? Questions or comments, I should say? One question I have is, um, I don't know if you want to talk about oh, yeah. sending the deadline for applications. So the deadline was originally April 1st for, dead, for um, students to apply. I think the concern of Franklin Tech, and I think I agree with it, it's a legitimate concern, is that students may have heard, well, you can't apply to, well, we never said that. Our counselors never said don't apply to Franklin Tech. It was always, if you're applying to Franklin Tech, you may want to also consider other options, pending a school committee vote. The concern that was expressed by Franklin Tech was that 
that message in and of itself might have precluded students from applying, so uh, we agreed to extend that deadline by a week to April 8th, so that any students who might have been um, caught in either misinformation or just not having, because the information wasn't settled at the time that they may have been interested, uh, would have time to resolve that. Uh, the reality is we did have kids apply to Franklin Tech um, as well as other schools um, from the message that they received from their guidance counselor in eighth grade. So it's not a huge concern of mine. It was a significant current concern of Franklin Tech's, and I think we worked on a reasonable solution to um, respond to that concern. Thank you, Thank you for pointing that out. So, hey, when I just, so did the field trip to Smith take place? So there were no so there were no field trips because that's what I had asked you right. previously, and you didn't even we didn't know when that would have been. So the so none of the middle eighth graders went to visit either school. That's correct. So what we uh, the middle school principal and I um, talked about last year was just the challenge of loss on learning. We had um, generally about four or five times the number of students go on the field trip than actually apply to a Vogue school, which made us somewhat question <laughs> the motivation. I'm not saying all of them, but, um, and so we still have access. We still, um, for students who come to their guidance counselor, and, you know, we have that conversation. We promote the dialogue between the Vogue school and the family and the student, but the field trip part of it, it was, um, it wasn't, it was never just, and I clarified this, the superintendent of Franklin raised this in the meeting and, and we didn't have a trip at all. Actually, last year we didn't have a trip to Smith either. We only had a trip to Franklin and that was, a longer story, but um, it was, there was no favoritism involved in field trips or not field trips. Thank you. Yeah. So just one question. Uh, thank you for meeting with the superintendent. Um, I think it was um, it's encouraging to hear that you were able to talk through some of the challenges. Um, my question is around the, so this arrangement is for the 2018-2019 tuition, you know, for uh, the towns. Is there any has there been any conversation about continuing that in future years or is this sort of a one-time only kind of thing from it's a one-time only kind of thing uh particularly because of the situation we're in i also uh just candidly um i think if we were going more than a year i'd want to bring it up not that i'm not bringing it up we're talking about a school committee meeting as school committee dialogue because doing that perhaps could preclude other, I just don't want to set a dynamic mm -hmm. that's a multi-year dynamic for future school committees without enough robust dialogue. So uh, he only raised it as a one-year um, issue given our fiscal um, challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, but frankly, I wouldn't have been comfortable going more than a year without more robust dialogue at this table with the community. Um, you know, the last time when well voted, um, the vote went the way it went. We had multiple meetings where it was discussed, four town meetings, school committee meeting, so um, anything beyond a one year, I would want a more, more robust discussion about. So that's as far as we got. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Um Yeah, so and first off, I appreciate the creativity that avoids us uh, what would have been a, a difficult town meeting <laughs> if, if the school committee decided to try and pursue the additional funds. Um, you know, and, you know and, and yet it does it does mean it's, it's a possibility in future years, and so, um, some members who had attended that um, that meeting advocating for us not to go through with the agreement with Smith Folk uh, had reached out to me later and I, I thought I had a pretty productive conversation with them explaining the, the reasons. And one thing I was very upfront with uh, is that, you know, if we get into a budget situation in the future, and it's certainly possible, who knows what the future may hold, um, this is something that would, you know, is, is it's possible for the school committee to still consider. And it's not. You know, there was some talk about, is this, you know, a small amount of money? And, you know, I think, you know, the 25000 was the minimum of a conservative estimate for the first year. Um, and, you know, when you're cutting more than a million dollars, every other dollar is very painful. So, um, I, you know, if, if it, it's, it's obviously hard to project future budgets, but it, 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 as soon as possible, if you think that's even a possibility, um, you know, if to cross our T's and dot our I's in terms of the community engagement piece ahead of time would be necessary so that if we come to the a vote again, even with people strongly in support or in objection to, you know, we could make, make the most informed decision. That's what I hope going forward. Do you think it would actually be worth um, scheduling a meeting, I mean, an item for a meeting mid mid I say mid-year now, but I don't know what mid-year means. I guess early next year, like October <laughs> or November of next year, yeah. in which we could talk, we could revisit mm -hmm. 
No, I don't want to say necessarily the topic of doing an agreement with Smith Vocational, but really revisit the discussion of vocational schools and enrollment and trends. And part of the basket of that will be fiscal issues, but it'll be, you know, up more than that, and that we could maybe even invite in uh, both superintendents or families and others to come in to sort of inform the committee on this um, in the future. We can parking lot that maybe for something for later. Yeah. Uh, anything else on this topic? Um, on school committee planning, I don't have any gifts. On school committee planning, one question I had, uh, Dr. Morris, is whether we could get, um, I don't want to say a revised schedule, but sort of an updated schedule of when some of the presentations were going to be done around the SETF goals. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean tonight, I mean in, in general. Yeah. Sort of be able to see them all right. as, a, as a list of when they're scheduled. Mm -hmm. Because also I think it would be, if we could do that soon, um, while you're still chair, I would love to see that pushed out if it hasn't already been to SETF members and others just so that there's more, there's a, I shouldn't say more awareness. I, we've talked about it here, it's been brought up occasionally at a couple other public events, but I just want to make sure that since it's something that I think the committee's going to enjoy or get fruitful conversation out of, um, but it's also something that keeps coming up as a question, especially around data and what we're doing and stuff like that. Um, I just think it's worth making sure that, you know, if there are members of the public who want to come, they, they know to come, and then they also can see sort of a, when the future meetings might be. Does that make sense to you? It does, yeah. Okay, that that'd good. be wonderful. Any other school committee planning issues? I'll go to yeah, her first. Yeah, outside defer. Yeah. So just looking at the regional advocacy um, piece, mm -hmm. and I was reminded um, some of the outreach I was doing to Representative Kulik's office uh, put me back in touch with a staffer who had helped with the delegation that um, I helped lead last year to, and Ms. Wamini Cage, uh, to Boston during the Mass Day on the Hill. And so I was just looking up the date again because um, the Mass Day on the Hill is on April 25th, which is smack in the middle of their budget week um, in Boston. And I'll have to say that, frankly, last year when we did this, um, I think the students reported back that um, the mask events were probably the least interesting to them. <laughs> um, unfortunately, they weren't geared towards students, and they were, you know, there was a, you know, uh, there were a couple of legislators who were there. Um, Sonia Chang Diaz was there, and you know, a few others. Um, but it was very much uh, about how school committee members can advocate on behalf of school, you know, um, issues, education-related <laughs> issues, not at all student-friendly or young person-friendly. Um, and I had talked to Glenn Kutcher about trying to change that, and that didn't happen. Anyway, long story. Uh, the point is that I'm, I'm raising this now because I, I do think it's still worth doing again and just figuring out what the timing might be. Maybe the timing is not that day on mm -hmm. the Hill. And also just wanted to raise the point, um, so I heard this from the staffer, from Representative Kulik staffer, that um, he had approached one of the students that we took on that delegation last year uh, after the fact and had, um, they had raised money to provide a scholarship for a student from, you know, from the, the, the representative's district and had suggested to this uh, Amherst Regional High School student to go ahead and apply for the scholarship because they thought given, you know, his work and interests and everything that he would be a great candidate. He ended up getting the scholarship and it wasn't a huge scholarship. It was, this, I think, about $1,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, he was going to college. It was a really helpful, you know, so it was an interesting little side door that opened as a result of that day uh, mm. on the Hill. And um, the students had, a, you know, a really good experience. Um, I think we would want to tailor it for a slightly different experience for them um, so that they are able to come in maybe with a set of agenda items and, you know, talk to the representatives and you know, legislators. Um, and their staffers in a slightly different way, but they really, you know, got a lot out of um, going to Stan Rosenberg's office and um, meeting with his chief of staff, and um, they met with Representative, Representative Goldstein Rose, and there were a few other, you know, people that they met with that day, um, and it was just a, a great experience. So I'd love to see that happen again if we can, um, and I just wanted to talk about that maybe at one of our coming meetings. Put it on the next agenda. Let's get that on the next agenda. Actually, we should have regional advocacy anyways, because I think that's going to be probably a standing item where there are going to be things coming up that mm -hmm. we ought to talk about as well as plan. Are there other 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 things on this? Yes. So um, now that our, our budget, I mean, we have 
the town-wide budget votes, but uh, our budget season uh, from school committee votes is over. Um, I talked to Dr. Moussad from the Collaborative about mm -hmm. strategic planning and wanting to get back in that game. I believe he's able to attend the meeting if we want him to on uh, April 10th. He sent some revised timelines given that we paused the process for a while and that there's summer, which lots of work can happen in the summer, and then some work can't happen in the summer just because it's not the people who aren't here. Um, and so he was interested in coming in at the next meeting on the 10th just for a quick update, revised timeline, and to re-engage the process. Um, and we don't have to make a decision now, but it just, you know, I wanted to share it uh, in this meeting. I also put on budget warrant review so that if we want to have a new process start, like I don't want to have like three meetings go and like, oh, we were going to have that thing about warrants, you know, because that could easily <coughs> happen, especially with the change in membership and other things that are happening in, in April and May that will keep us busy. Um, I had superintendent evaluation. I think having that continue to be on there and just fine tuning mm -hmm. dates. Um, uh, Ms. Cunningham is planning on doing the um, the goal two discussion about still learning about race, class, and other equity mm -hmm. issues at that meeting. Um, so I have strategic planning, budget warrant review, policy. There's at least one, but multiple first reads. Regional advocacy, SETF goal two, and superintendent evaluation. Um, and then the point that Ms. Ardona has raised about MASC. Regional, I'd call it regional advocacy, and then it would include the MASC thing under it. Okay. Um, so it's hard to project, but whether it would rise to the level of agenda item, but I assume it won't hit on the topic of the marijuana dispensaries. Whether it's at announcements or superintendent update, I don't know, you know, because we don't know what's going to. Uh, why, don't, why don't we, I mean, we'll put it this way. If something happens, this is not locked in right now. We're, we're just talking in a meeting about what we're going to do. If out of tomorrow's meeting or anything subsequently that comes immediately in mind out of that, if it calls for its own agenda item, then let let me and Dr. Morris know that. I mean, anyone who goes, so I think if you see two people might be going. Um, and we can put it on. Otherwise, it is absolutely warranted within the announcements or the superintendent's update section to, to give us update on that. So let's keep it open that at the very least we can talk about it then. Um, but otherwise, if there's enough momentum behind the discussion and the information where it should, we should talk about it as a separate item, just let us know. Okay. One sort good. of bookkeeping one, which is um, <clears throat> I'm guessing we have a rather large stack of executive session minutes that need to be approved, and we may want to choose to do that before we have significant change in membership. I think we're going to miss that boat, but yes. Okay. We'll take care of that. They're just harder to No, no, it's them. an awesome point. I'm just saying we have, we have, uh, we have, um, we have Ms. Ardonias here, who is Union 26. Mm -hmm. There's me. There's Debbie. Between between the three of us, we will figure out the solution to making sure we have a stack of minutes, and then we will we will schedule the appropriate time to execute on that item because it's a good point. Mm -hmm. As soon as possible. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay. Anything else? Thursday. Bye. Just yes. can I offer a final thanks um, to our. Um, Phoebe and Vera, for your service. I've learned a lot from both of you in my time on this committee. Is this really it, by the way? Is it? Isn't it? This is really it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you're prolonging it. Move to adjourn. No, 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 that's my job. Well, you get to move I to adjourn. No, no, okay, I'm looking for a move, <laughs> move to adjourn. adjourn. Seconded. <laughs> it's been, it's been moved by Ms. Hazard, seconded by Ms. Duomini Cage. All those in favor reluctantly to end their last meeting? <laughs> all right, all right. It's unanimous.